Okay, Jack, we're good to go. Good to go. All right. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of May 12th, 2021, based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Jack Jemsek, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at uh, 6.37 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer firmly, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow? Here. Tom Long? Here. Andrew McDougall? Present. Doug Marshall? Present. Janet McGowan? Here. Johanna Newman? Here. Great, and myself. So board members, if technical issues arise, please let Pam know if technical difficulties occur, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. Uh, discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if this happened. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call you on, on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. <clears throat> public comment may, uh, may also be heard at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware that the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment, join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link as shown. And it's also listed on the town website via the calendar listing for this meeting or you can go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda which lists the uh, Zoom link at the top of the page. Please indicate if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button uh, when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting, use a telephone. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute. When finished speaking, Oh, when finished speaking, <laughs> sorry. Uh, residents can express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. So um, we can just get into it. Um, we have no minutes uh, as part of item one. And then uh, item two is the public comment um, period and I'm, um, Looking to see, uh, okay, I see two hands raised, Elizabeth Verling and Susanna Musbrat. So you wanna start with uh, Elizabeth and Hi, state Elizabeth. your name and address, please. Hi, Elizabeth, can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes, this is Elizabeth Verling at 36 Cottage Street. Um, and I would like to speak in strong support of the inclusionary zoning bylaw that's been discussed and will be the subject of the public hearing next week. I'm encouraged to see this being developed, especially considering that it was not even on the list of major zoning priorities put forward by the CRC. So I wanna thank the planning department and the board for this very important effort and important bylaw. Uh, my second comment concerns parking downtown in particular with regard to the consideration of even more high-rise residential development that dismayingly seems to promise to be the infill envisioned between One East Pleasant and Kendrick Place. I note that the parking study by the, done by the town as documented on the town website was conducted prior to occupation of the aforementioned buildings and I'm dismayed to see the town even considering building another large residential building without consideration for parking. I don't understand the justification for this approach. The newly proposed building would result in a net loss of approximately 30 permitted parking spaces, as it will occupy what is currently a parking lot of approximately 45 spaces, and the new building will only provide in 16. In addition, there seems to be an assumption that the student population to which the building is targeted does not require cars. I provide the data that 26% of students living on campus have cars and they do not even need to go off campus to buy food. It's not hard to do the math to determine that more than 16 parking spaces are required for a building with beds for 134 students. 
In all, it seems to me as if the developer is taking advantage of the poor town parking regulations, just as the same developer took advantage of the poor setback regulations when building One East Pleasant. In fact, at the last planning board meeting, the developer essentially blamed the poor streetscape at One East Pleasant on the town, saying they met the standards. I hope that the town requires more in the future from developers than taxes, as the burden of parking will then fall on the residential taxpayers when a parking garage is finally unavoidable. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Susanna, state your name and address, please. Hi, Susanna, can you unmute yourself? Hi, Susanna. Uh, am I unmuted? You yes. are. Okay, good. Susanna Mosprat, 38 North Prospect Street. I would just like to um, thank the planning department for finally getting up the website that um, talks about the various zoning amendments and helps us keep track of where each of them stands in the process. Um, my one suggestion is that it would be much more useful if the various letters and public comments you have received could be sorted according to the amendment to which they pertain because it's uh, pretty tedious to go through the whole mess of stuff to try to tease out what people are saying about each of the amendments. But I am glad that it's there and I thank you for your effort on that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, with that said, we got item three, zoning priorities, uh, continued discussion about proposed changes to the mixed use buildings, section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw, definition standards and criteria and proposed change to parking requirements, section 7.00 of the zoning bylaw for mixed use buildings. So we have an update, is that Nate or? Sure, sure. Okay. Um... I can speak to it. The um, Thanks everyone, this is Nate Malloy. I'm a planner with the town and uh, I, I'll share my screen in a minute. I forgot where we left off, honestly, with mixed use buildings. Um, Sorry for not introducing you, Nate. Uh, oh, that's all right, Jack. <laughs> the, um, the, the mixed use building standards went, uh, the CRC reviewed them recently and you know they still had some comments. And so we're bringing it back to the planning board uh, for your review, staff feels like the mixed use building uh, bylaw is, 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 you know, almost in its, uh, in its current condition to be recommended as a zoning proposal. And so I think, you know, we can go over the points at the CRC still questions. And I think, you know, the, the, you know, what I've observed as presenting it to the planning board and the CRC is that there's some inconsistency of, of opinion between the planning board, the public and the CRC in terms of what what standards and conditions need to be in a mi the mixed use um, the mixed use bylaw, and so um, I think that's something that can be part of the discussion. So I'll let me share my screen. Um, is that is the bylaw visible to everyone and, and legible as well? Uh, yes. Can you go I to think, the top? Yes, yeah, so I think you know last time, or I think we discussed that the the mixed use buildings. Um, Really, there's just you know a provision in the use chart that has somewhat of a definition and then a few standards and conditions. And the idea is to essentially everything in red is existing and it's being removed. And then you know what we're proposing is a new definition, an actual definition of a mixed use building in section 12. Um, you know, uh, keeping that uh, management plan is required. There is a condition right now in um, you know, in the BL districts, not abutting BG and commercial that if, you know, there's 10 units, um, if there's more than 10 units above the first floor, it needs a, um, uh, you know, a, a special permit. And that's something we're removing, recommending removing as it seems um, not necessarily relevant right now if we have more standards and conditions. And then there are some provisions about gross floor area and what could be residential um, use. So. Um, you know, with the definition, we're saying a mixed use building containing one or more dwelling units. And so essentially, you know, if there's um, residential or parking 
and then non-residential. So one or more dwelling unit in combination with permitted non-residential and parking where no more than 50% of the ground or first floor should be a combination of residential or parking. So that's really the definition, um, which there isn't right now in the bylaw. So essentially, you know, the 50% is a big one saying, you know, 50% um, can, no more than 50% could be parking or, or residential. So right now, you know, we could have a mixed use building with a small office space and the rest of it could be residential or, um, you know, on, on the first floor. Um, and, and the other piece here is that um, the uses, the residential use and parking use shall be at the rear of the building or not visible from the public way or areas customarily used by pedestrians in the public. And so, um, you know, it's not just the right of way, it's also if, you know, the building has walkways or plazas on some of the sides of the building, if they're providing retail, we'd like to have those front on those areas. Um, a change is saying that for sloping lots or lots with frontage on more than one right of way, the permit granting authority shall determine which floor of the building contains the non-residential use or parking use. And so this is trying to accommodate uh, buildings that may actually you know, be on a corner or where there's topography change. And depending on the design of the building, uh, it's really, you know, the permit granting authority now has the ability to say, okay, what's the first floor? And then they can regulate that 50%. Um, the parking has been refined to say for vehicles, bicycles, and other modes. And so there was a question previously about, you know, what is the parking use? Um, so residential use is, you know, everything, uh, you know, the, the units themselves and incidental space, uh, excluding bicycle storage. And then the non-residential use is really any commercial retail or other uses permitted in, um, in the bylaw. And, you know, I think, the, the, the next, so that's the definition. So that's, you know, a standalone definition that could be in article 12. Um, the CRC, the Community Resource Committee, you know, it, uh, I think they think the definition is, is pretty refined right now and, and okay. The, in terms of standards and conditions, you know, the product open space staff has kept it in, in there that, um, you know, 10% of the building uh, footprint, including, um, areas under upper floors be provided as open space. And it's open space that would be um, used by the occupants and visitors. Uh, and, you know, um, it can't be in areas that are driveways for HVAC areas. Um, a change is saying that an applicant may waive uh, or modify, so decrease or increase this provision through a special permit with the permit granting authority uh, for compelling reasons of safety, aesthetics, and site design. And so, those reasons of safety, aesthetics, and site design is referenced to other places in the bylaw for the ability to waive um, a standard or condition. And I will say that the Community Resource Committee uh, feels that the 10%, you know, doesn't quite work, um, and they're not sure, you know, if, if this is ne necessary. Um, you know, staff thinks that there's a difference between a setback and open space. And so, for instance, on One East Pleasant, uh, you know, it's really close to the setback, right? But there's a plaza underneath the upper floor uh, on, on the entrance to the restaurant. So it actually has product open space, even though it has no setback. And so, you know, the, the idea here, the, the idea that it could be waived or modified is important because with mixed use buildings, you know, there's a setback that has uh, an, an implication for the streetscape and the building, the distance from curb to building front. But then there's also the ability to say, okay, well, what are the uses, the non-residential uses of a mixed use building? And do we actually wanna carve out space that may or may not be in the setback to provide you know, areas for dining or for extra sitting or for residents? And so um, you know, I think you know, it could be that this could be waived or modified without the provision of a special permit. We could say that it could just be waived or modified with the permit granting authority uh, as part of the review and not required an additional special permit. So that's something to consider, but, you know, staff feels like having this provision is important um, just because a, a open space is different than setback. Um, we're saying that the developer, if we move on to outdoor amenities, we're saying the developer is required to provide, shall be required to provide outdoor amenities that bez benefit residents and users of the building. So again, occupants and visitors. Um, bedroom count, we've, we've refined this a little bit and uh, the apartments, um, you know, the staff, planning staff is also, uh, is working on updating the apartment section of the bylaw. And so this bedroom count language is now consistent between both apartments and mixed use buildings. 
saying that no more than 50% of the total dwelling units shall have the same bedroom count. So last time was a difference between size or type. And really we've just said the same bedroom count, which is I think clearer uh, with the exception of a mixed use building containing uh, less than five units. So for a small mixed use building, you know, they don't have to um, comply with this provision. And again, we're also saying that the permit granting authority may waive or modify this if uh, the units are affordable. Um, again, we're allowing parking within buildings um, as long as it's contained within buildings. So, you know, there has been a discussion, do we want to have parking in a building? And if we look at the new building, 11 to 13 East Pleasant Street that's being proposed, there's retail in the front and then there's parking, you know, within the building and the back of the building. And, you know, if, you know, staff thinks that that's, that's reasonable, that there would be parking in buildings. And, you know, there's been some discussion about, do we want to provide or allow parking within buildings? Mm -hmm. And I think it's reasonable. It could be within the building or in the site, but given um, our other build out requirement, you know, build out standards, our dimensional standards and BG, um, someone may want a, a bigger building and actually have parking covered. We also added another provision here with parking. Uh, and again, this is going to be consistent with um, apartment buildings. Adequate parking shall be provided. The amount of parking spaces provided for each, we'll say mixed use building or dwelling unit shall be based on factors, including but not limited to bedroom count, analysis of traffic impact reports, proximity to downtown, proximity to public transit, proximity to public parking, including on and off street parking, availability of alternative modes of transportation, tenant lease restrictions, and shared or leased parking as regulated in accordance with section 7.2. And so, you know, this provision right here is saying that there, there does need to be parking and, and um, we're giving the permit granting authority more guidance um, as to what, what to use to actually discuss parking with an applicant. And in section 7.7, .7, it would say that mixed use buildings and apartments are exempt from the requirement of, you know, two spaces per unit but that they would have to comply with, um, with this, you know, providing parking studies or, um, you know, more information. And so, you know, if a building was, what well, makes this building is proposed, the permit granting authority could say, okay, we really wanna know if, if the applicant owns other buildings or manages them, what is the breakdown of number of parking permits issued for the tenants? How many tenants do have cars? And so those are things that could be asked um, as part of the analysis. Uh, and one thing that remains the same is that the permit granting authority shall apply the design review provisions of section, you know, the design review principles, you know, section 3.2040 mm -hmm. and 3.2041. And, you know, this is a change in that before it was a may be required and we're, we're keeping this as a shall be applied. And so, you know, again, the CRCs discussed this and staff thinks that, you know, the design review principles in sections 11.24 for site plan review have enough there are um, enough provisions about um, design of a building in terms of its massing and relationship to context that the a permit granting authority, the planning board can, you know, discuss this with an applicant. So maybe a building does need to be step, uh, set back a little bit or certain things need to change based on some of these design provisions. And it's something that hasn't been done necessarily in the past as strongly, but I think if we're saying that it shall apply it, that it becomes, um, you know, it becomes a tool, a, a better tool that can be used by the planning planning board. And so I think that's, I can wrap it up and just take comments. And... Okay. Um, I have ju just, uh, I have two comments mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm wondering about the parking being limited to 50%, um, mm -hmm. where we you know th there are concerns with parking, uh, Right. generally where these mixed use buildings would go. And also I'm wondering, uh, kind of dovetail with that, uh, provisions for like uh, basement parking, uh, how would that work? Uh, could, you know, should that be encouraged? Um, you know, as was done for the, uh, the central uh, parking garage that we have there at, at Boltwood. And, and the other question or, or, or comment, I guess, so, it looks like with regard to the uh, Spring Street uh, development by Arco, uh, Archipelago and Amir Southeast Street, those, I, I believe those are all kind of monochromatic with regard to the, the bedrooms. And so just 
clarifying that those buildings would not be approved with this type of bylaw in place. Right, so like a, a mixed use building, right? Or an apartment building, you know, we have that provision, couldn't have, you know, 50 one bedroom apartments. And so really we're trying to encourage, you know, they could have just half be one size and half be the other, another bedroom count, but really it's trying to encourage, you know, a mix of different unit sizes, um, you know, uh, and also that could help with, you know, different tenants. Uh, the parking, yeah, staff has considered whether the 50% um, should be waivable or modifiable. And I think, um, Jack, I think it's a good um, discussion, especially given the new building that's being proposed, you know, would they, does the new building meet this 50% and it's pretty close depending on what you count as, um, you know, like does the leasing office and fitness room on 11 to 13 East Pleasant count as the non-residential space and what, you know, how do you add that up? So, um, you know, I think the real, the, the, the um, issue right now is that there really isn't any definition of what, how to, you know, what proportion of space is dedicated to retail or commercial in a mixed use building and how is it oriented to the street or areas used by the public. And so, um, you know, whether or not the 50% is the right percentage, um, you know, it seems like it, was, it would work uh, for most. And then maybe there needs to be a provision that it could be waived uh, somehow. Yeah, I think I, to me, it seems like, you know, parking is always coming up and mm -hmm. uh, to make, you know, give some flexibility for adding parking within a building mm -hmm. would be a good thing. Uh, okay, so uh, looking to other board members, Janet, please. And then Doug and then Andrew. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jack. And thank you, Nate. You know, Jack, I wonder, can we go like section by section and hear people's comments on each? Because um, I have sort of different, I have like five different comments on different sections and I, like, I don't want to keep jumping around and then Doug has things. So could we like, could we start from the beginning? Um, should I, roll, should I scroll? I can, I can scroll up. If, yeah, so you know, just... I, I don't want to, I mean, I, I thought if we go, to, if we go section by section and hear comments on it and then move on to another one, does that, does that, that seems easy, like more focused to me, or I can give you my big list. <laughs> and then um, I have my pen and paper. I'm ready for a big list. Janet. Yeah, I, I would say, I would just roll with a big list, Janet. Okay. I think okay. it'd just be easier and quicker, I think. Okay, so I, yeah. went, I remember voting on a mixed use amendment in town meeting in 2016. So I went back and looked at that and the, the recommendation then, which was supported by the select board, the planning department, planning board, was only 40% residential. And so the idea was the first floor would be 60%, you know, commercial retail um, office space. And then also the recommendation was that 25% of the bedroom units would be, 25% um, would be four bedrooms. And I think that was an effort not to have a building kind of overcome by student housing. And so that went through town meeting. I think I got a majority, but it didn't get two thirds. And so. One of my questions was for the planning department is like, why didn't, why are we like going from 40% residential? So the ground floor is mostly for retail or business or commercial. And why did we, why is it being dropped to less? I mean, it's 60% for commercial and 40% residential. Like, so what's the thinking there? Because. Well, I think, I mean, Jack was even considering going you know, less on retail if we want to have more parking. So, you know, we're thinking, you know, 50% is dedicated to, you know, retail, commercial, or the non-residential piece, right? And 50% to um, residential or parking. So, um, so could, you know, could, the, could the ground floor be parking, like half of it residential parking, the other half commercial parking? Like that was, I'm a little lost on the, like, what, what could parking be? Could it just be a parking, you know, half for, I mean, is that possible? No, it's not possible. Okay. So, so anyway, I'm just wondering, like previously, they, you know, you were looking for sixty percent being commercial retail office space and forty percent residential. So the first floor is really mostly for business, and then the rest of it is residential. So I was just kind of wonder. I looked at the old one and I thought, well, everybody was on board with that, and so I wonder what has shifted. Well, I think some of it is the reality of how you know. If, if we're requiring that 60% of the first floor be a retail use, you know, that could be really limiting in terms of how do you fill that space? You know, we're, um, 
you know, so you have a building that may only have a small frontage, but it is a big lot. And so how, you know, how do they fill the back part of that space with a, with a non-residential use, a retail use? And so, you know, some mixed use bylaws have some flexibility and they don't say, you know, 60% or higher because if the market is not, you know, if, if we don't have a market for that, for the retail or the non-residential uses, you know, what, what's happening there? Is it just going to be vacant space? And so, so, so part of the concern that I have, and, you know, I think that Kendrick Place brought some office space to downtown, but One East Pleasant, like, knocked out 12 or 15 businesses, and then this new, 11 East Pleasant, there's three or four businesses, and so when people talk about viability of retail, I'm thinking a lot of people closed shop, a lot of people moved elsewhere. So those businesses may have been small and, you know, I, you know, like the Amherst Music supported this family for decades and they closed, you know, King Taylor's is now in South Amherst. And so, you know, if there's no, if there's no retail spaces, you know, and we're saying, oh, retail is dead, but we're actually use, putting in basically what look almost like apartment houses, replacing small businesses. It's kind of a chicken and egg. And I'd like to keep the retail spaces there, you know, for, and if, if we're, if we're reducing, if we're closing small retail shops and reducing, like they can't come back, they can't fit into this space anymore. And they're like, oh, nothing's viable. Well, there's no place for them. And so I, I think that we should make some more space and for small businesses that were functioning beforehand and closed because either they moved or they were, had no place to rent anymore. So, so, that, that, so my pitch would be, why don't we do 60% on the first floor for um, retail, commercial, professional. The other thing was I wondered um, about, you know, the idea of limiting the number of four bedroom units. Like, I don't know how that would apply to 11 East Pleasant, but I just thought, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to make sure that we have mixed income, mixed families, single people, students, and not like a monolith of any one type in any community um, or any like area of the town. So I wondered if that might be something that the board want to talk about. Um, the other thing I was, I didn't think about, but when you mentioned it was, I didn't think that setback, setbacks was different from project open space, just from reading this. And so maybe that could be made more clear. Um, what else? Um, and then on the exception language for um, making smaller project open space, I just think like, you know, I think we can just stick with the standard and enforce it. And if, you know, the developer is always gonna ask for an exception and then we're gonna always be, you know, giving it or not giving it and kind of creating inconsistency. And it's hard for me to understand the situation where you couldn't have 10% open space on the lot. Like what would those reasons be? So my feeling was like, let's just keep it simple and be clear and just say, okay, this is not an exception sort of situation. Um, so that, so those are some ideas. I, I think the parking is a huge issue and I'd love to talk about it a little more separately because it's kind of rewriting our park section, um, article seven, our parking bylaw to the point where it was unclear to me when you would require two units to parking spaces per unit. And I thought that was sort of a massive change that we hadn't talked about or seen. And my recommendation would be not to do this now because we don't really have the data set that supports it. And again, you'll have the planning board, you know, wading into like, you know, in, 19, in 2020, who is what bedrooms and who is using what. And, you know, these buildings are built for decades and we can't predict what the future will be. And you know, we know that more people have cars in Amherst than they did 10 years ago. We know that fewer people are using buses. We know that we have almost 5,000 more students going to UMass. Um, we know that driverless cars are coming and EVs. And so I don't know, you know, all the trends are kind of going towards more car, not less. And we don't, and we know that students have lots, you know, drive a lot. Undergraduates at Salem Place, it's completely full. The lot is full. And so I don't know, I just, I just thought, I had the impression from, I don't know if this is last year, I've kind of in COVID times, but when we were talking about parking with Michi, that was pretty clear that we would need to have parking studies. You know, we knew the parking bylaw had to be changed, but we also need, we need studies and there might be studies for different areas of town or different types of users. And so 
I think that's like a huge issue that has kind of showed up in here. And if you want to move this forward, I think it'd be best just to take it out. And, um, you know, to me, I was just, I, I was kind of overwhelmed. Like it's literally the 15th or 16th zoning bylaw change we will have be dealing with in 50, you know, in, in this year. And I just thought, I don't know, I just thought, ah, let's not do it here. Although I did like the line, parking will be adequate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, I was Jeff, like, I I was like a... can you stop there? You know, kind of thing. Oh, that's so. fine, Jack, could I just have a minute to just, uh, I just want to respond to one or two. Um... Well, I would just oh, say okay. that um, the, the, with the parking, I, 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 it is very debatable from what Janet says and from my observation, because I, I feel like there are less cars. Uh, I know from my family, there's less cars. There's not, you know, I just know that. And and, and I know, you know, but Jack, Uber more and, and Lyft and all that is a, is a thing and people can get by on that. But Jack, there uh, are more cars registered in Amherst than there were 10 years ago. And there's more people, yeah. Well, that that we'll find out very shortly. But we know there's many more students, and we know bus ridership yeah. goes down by like four or five percent a year. So on that note, I'm I'm wondering, can't off campus folks get parking permits uh, on campus? Well, that... so I think you know the downtown parking permits are very inexpensive. You know, thirty five, twenty five dollars, whatever it is. It's really it's almost so cheap that it's not a commodity. And so there was a discussion with the downtown parking working group a few years ago to say, let's make it 200 or 300 and that, that totally rocked the boat. And so that didn't really go anywhere other than a discussion. Um, you know, some communities limit permits to people who register their cars in town. So who have, you know, who pay excise tax to the community. So there was discussions about how to, you know, I mean, there's so many, I think parking is a big issue. And so how do you, you know, what's the right, what's the right way to regulate it? Do you, you know, I think it's, there's many approaches. It's, you know, a system of both the permit on street system, you know, off street parking, you know, with the university. So um, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I wasn't going to address that. I was going to just going to say, Janet, to your bedroom count, you know, I looked at a few, right. The mixed use building um, Bila had a number of amendments. So did apartments a few times. And so actually Ironically, at one point we try to regulate the number of four bedroom units and then a few years later we try to regulate the number of one bedroom units because then we realized people were creating one bedroom units for students and I feel like um, Is there I think it's really difficult to really dictate percentage of, of specific unit sizes because the market may change and so I think you know the CRC discussed this too and they felt like it's really difficult to say let's just say 25% four bedroom or 30% three bedroom because market conditions may change. And so um, they were comfortable with, you know, no more than 50% be one bedroom size because, um, you know, the permit grading authority may always ask about the bedroom count, but I think it's really difficult to say a certain size. What if in a few years, you know, right now people are building a lot of ones and twos. So if we try to limit ones and twos, but then all of a sudden a few, you know, I feel like the market does move. So it's really difficult to have a really detailed um, thing there. Nick, the other one with the product have, open space. I'm sorry. Yeah thought about that too. And for instance, like on the Hastings block in certain blocks, buildings um, are right up against the, um, the setback because they're older. And if they were ever rebuilt, we may want to have or waive the product open space for that in that product in that instance, because we actually want to have a consistent street front, you know, a, a, a consistent facade line. And so, you know, I think Mixed use buildings are allowed in more than the downtown, but in certain areas of the BG, I actually think maybe the project open space should be waived or modified. But in other parts of downtown or BL or other village centers where mixed use buildings are allowed, maybe it doesn't need to be modified. But I think requiring it could be a detriment to a number of properties that are currently developed if they ever redevelop because um, you know people like the way the streetscape is designed, and so. I think, you know, those are the, anyways, those are two points that staff had talked about, about why have to have those provisions in there. Um, the other thing about the open space, what I like ab about pro project open space is that it also, I mean, both site plan review and special permit require, you know, recreational space, open space and amenities for, you know, and so that could be part of that, you know. Um, so I, I thought that kind of, I do like that idea. Um, of having some green space, you know, you know, it can be in the back, it could be, you know, whatever, the, working on the side and things like that. And I like the idea of creating community space. 
Oh, I do too. Don't get me wrong. I just, yeah, yeah. Know, <laughs> I feel like it's a high bar. That's why it, we, we kept it as a special permit to waive or modify it. The CRC said, you know, they didn't like the idea of adding a special permit to a use that may be a uh, site plan or view use. But, you know, we modify dimensional standards through special permit now. And I think that I don't find it necessarily confusing. Uh, you know, that was mentioned as, uh, as something, but I think, I, you know, staff thought keeping it a special permit does raise the bar a little bit. So an applicant really has to make the case why they can't provide it. You know, they can't just say, oh, we, you know, they actually have to maybe show on a site plan or something why that open space isn't feasible. Um, so let's, let's hear from, um, yeah. you know, we got Doug, Uana and Andrew and then, and, and Janet, you're certainly welcome to, to okay. come back in after all that. So uh, Doug, please. Yeah, I had uh, two two comments. The first one is the requirement for the uh, for no more than fifty percent of the units to be of one bedroom count. Um, I can, particularly for smaller uh, buildings, I can imagine that they're gonna that they could end up with basically having two unit bedroom counts, you know, a bunch of one bedrooms and a bunch of two bedrooms. And say they have, each floor has a uniform number of one bedrooms and two bedrooms, the same number, and but it's three stories. So now I've got an uneven number of units and one or the other is 50% plus one. So I think your limit ought to be 50% plus one just to accommodate situations where there's two unit types, they're equal in number, except you know, there's an uneven number of units overall. And then the second thing I was going to comment on was the uh, requirement that the parking not be visible from the public way or walkways and areas customarily used by pe uh, pedestrians. Maybe I've watched too many television shows, but parking garages and covered parking can be scary places where you're alone, it's poorly lit, and you know if there's no visibility, it may be a public safety issue. So I, I support the, you know, if the intent is to have the parking not sort of broadcast itself to the street, I support that. But I think to have it completely invisible from the street or anywhere a pedestrian might be, might be going too far. Um, and, you know, we happen to have the 11 East Pleasant Street project before us, which I don't think meets that requirement, even though there's a bunch of retail in the front and there's that leasing office farther back. You know, there are moments, there are places where you can see through to the parking. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. So I would somehow edit that to be less uh, strict or, or rigid. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. I would assume that 11 to 13 East Pleasant meets this. I guess it well, depends on right house. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's places on that sidewalk where you can stand and see between those two blocks into the parking area. And it might even, you know, even if you're, you're a little bit farther north from the building, right. looking along the edge, uh, where the vehicle access drive is, you can yeah, probably yeah. see diagonally in there. So, so, you know, I think we either need to be clearer about our criteria and how we define what's visible and what's not, or, you know, just not be quite as uh, broad in the, in the statement. Mm -hmm. Doug, you have me like going like, you know, counting how many action scenes in uh, parking lots and movies that I've seen. There are a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The parking garage is where all the fun stuff happens. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Doug. That's a good point. I mean, I think, right, um, maybe the definition definition is a little broad. You know, my thought is, you know, at any certain angle, you might be able to see into the parking area. So on 11 to 13 East Pleasant, is that really 
in an area customarily used by the public, um, you know, so, I, you know, I think that's something staff can look at and determine is this, does this, does, you know, would this language um, change how that, you know, how that uh, would, would work if this bylaw yeah. was in place? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, uh, Andrew, I think you had your hand up first, and uh, so I'll go with you, please. Thanks, Jack. Um, uh, enjoy the presentation again. Um, some of my, my comments are, were already addressed. I have, so like just a real minor one, um, it's just in, in the project open space, like the word landscaping to me, just, it just drives me nuts because it's like a catch all for just green things. Um, and it just, if the, if the purpose is open space, like it, it should be like some sort type of plaza or seating area, which could be defined with, you know, some type of landscaping, but, um, the way I was reading this, like you could just plant a sea of shrubs and say that that's your open space because it's landscaping. Um, I'm not super worried given, given the fact that you've got waivers and, and things in here that there are uh, opportunities to comment on that, but um, just a, maybe just uh, projecting a personal frustration of mine. Like the idea is like some an open space you can go into. Um, so that was all, thanks. Well, thanks, Andrew. We did have at one point that landscaping with an open space should be limited to 20% of the open space. And, you know, then that, that was criticized a bit by being too prescriptive. So I think that would be some, some language in there like that, just because I agree. What if someone proposed having ground cover as their whole open space and it really isn't a usable open space? Um, yeah, I think usability is, is the key. And then like how that's defined could be hardscape, could be greenscape. Um, and I think there should be some flexibility in that, but but more like the spirits, make sure there's somewhere for people to go, not not just to look at. Thanks. Um, and we have Johanna next, please. Thanks so much, um, Nate. It's really cool to see this evolve. Thanks for all your time and energy on it, and for incorporating all the comments. Um, you know my. Um, the stuff that pops out to me is also the parking, but I think I come down on it from a really different standpoint from a lot of the public comments and from what other people have said, which is, um, I think the demographic trends are clear that younger people are excited about um, and increasingly driving less and looking for non-car modes of transportation. And um, if we build it, they will come. Um, so I think, you know, if we are successful in building a downtown that is walkable and bikeable and doesn't require cars, then there are so many great uses for that space that don't involve storing, you know, private or even shared vehicles. So, you know, I think 50% is, you know, it, like you're, you're straddling the middle, right? Like we're at this inflection point as a society and yes, some people feel like I absolutely still need a car and some people are ready to let them go. And it, to me, 50% feels like um, acknowledging the reality of where the world is at. And I just commend you for your thoughtful work on this. Thanks, Johanna. Um, Maria? Um, okay, so let's see. A lot of things have already been covered. And so I guess... Um, Thanks again, Nate, for a great uh, presentation. I like how, like Yana is saying, how it's evolved. I think um, the things about the waivers are a good thing because um, every site is different. And then downtown is very different than everything sort of outside of downtown or even village centers. So when you say, when you prescribe things and have so many different kinds of sites with different kinds of challenges, limitations, it is better to embed what you've done, which is these waivers saying, you know, here's what we would hope you would do, but if your site doesn't allow it, you know, there are ways to work around that. And I think that's important because um, to give up valuable real estate where there's really small lots or difficult lots to say, you know, you have to provide this much parking, or you have to provide this much open space that's usable. I think that's, um, yeah, it's detrimental to some projects. So it's good to give a little leeway. It's not to say, you know, this is a way for developers to find an out. It's literally saying 
every site is different. And that's why we have different zones with different, um, you know, um, regulations. So I think that uh, I, I do like that um, the open space has a waiver. I'm actually leaning toward not making special permit, but since you were saying other things with diminish, dimensional changes require special permits, that's, that's fine. Um, same with parking. I like that sort of paragraph you've added because I feel like this, this planning board has actually done that for a lot of projects where we evaluate the site, its limitations, and based on you know how close it is to, I mean, everything you said in that paragraph, basically, we, we, we use that criteria to say, all right, you deserve this waiver, or actually, can you squeeze in a couple more spaces? So I think that's a good thing to do in the meantime, because to hold every project moving forward to that two spaces per unit, or whatever it is, two per bedroom, or I can't remember what it was, but it's kind of, um, uh, it's on its way out, I, I, I'm thinking. So we don't know what it is, but, um, it's just, it's something we debate every time. So to have this sort of um, little wiggle room is good. And then um, the last thing, I can't read my writing. Um, last thing, the thing what Doug was bringing up about the, you know, the uh, parking uh, being visible, maybe it's just adding the word not visible from the main public way. You know, obviously you'll see it from some sort of pedestrian way, but just say not from the major, street or major public thoroughfare somehow defining that one sort of maybe the cent center point of the building or something on the street yeah just just give it yeah the, the idea is that from the main sort of thing you see on the front you don't see the entry but maybe of course you'll see on the side and that's visible to pedestrians um otherwise yeah i think you're getting like you're every time we hear i see it, it's like inching closer and closer to the target and i think um, you're, you, you guys know what you're doing in, in the planning department. So I um, really appreciate all your hard work. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I hope this moves forward. I think um, I don't mind coming up. Uh, I don't mind hearing all these different zoning amendments. It's really exciting because it feels like, you know, we're, we're really getting good work done. So thanks again. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, there's really good comments and discussion happening. So it helps with, you know, going to the CRC and planning board and then being able to, you know, bring it back again. So I think it's, you know, there's been some nice comments tonight. And so, you know, with the CRC at the last meeting, um, you know, a week and a half ago or so now with tonight, you know, there'll probably be another version uh, that incorporates, you know, the next, these recent round of comments. Thank you. I see Janet's hand. Janet. Thank you. It's interesting to hear what everybody has to say. I think the parking issue is might sink this zoning vial mixed use zoning vital <laughs> amendment um so i don't know where these studies are that americans are abandoning cars and you know maybe younger people are in urban areas but they're not living in amherst and i would someone give me some information because students in amherst you know students that are renting houses near the downtown have four or five cars parked in front of them or on the lawn um, more UMass students have cars than they had 10 years ago. Um, I don't have any data that shows what people are thinking is happening. And so I really don't want us to really amend Article 7 without evidence. And Chris Bressrup had said a year or so ago, if, you know, we do need to work on the parking thing, but we need studies to support it. And there might be different things, you know, different parking requirements for different parts of the town which is sort of what Northampton has done. So I, I just don't, I think this is gonna easily sync it with many members of the council. Also, a lot of people in Amherst, you know, use cars to travel to different places. A lot of people who are older might have mobility problems or jobs somewhere else. And so, you know, we might say, we have a no parking district downtown that we know isn't working. And um, we know there's lots of people who are living downtown who are either parking illegally or have these things. And so, you know, I don't know where this idea is. Like, you know, I'm sure in Somerville, Mass, you know, very few people, less people have cars. But I just think we need to stay on a data-driven thing. We don't have the data. And I could, you know, I could, I, you know, I, so, so we have, as Maria said, since I've been on the planning board, waived, you know, reduced the parking requirements sometimes to less than one, um, you know, parking space per unit. Those buildings haven't been built yet, and we don't know how they're going to work in real life. We do know that at um, 
sale in place, which is filled with undergrads, those parking, those two parking spaces, we know that those are filled. Mr. Um, Roblaski has just asked for um, a demolition permit to take down that um, that white Victorian house on you know the, on Main Street. I think it's three four thirty two Main Street, and he wants to put parking, replace that building with parking and storage space. And so, um, so Southeast Street Commons hasn't been built. Spring Street hasn't been built. Um, Main Street LLC is already looking for more parking. That we don't know how that's going to work. South, you know, University Drive South, let, you know, not two spaces. Uh, we don't know how that's going to work. So I would really, really argue and really ask that this not be these these this language is amending the zoning, you know, Article Seven, and it's actually not so clear. It's going to have the Planning Board time and time again making decisions or the ZBA collecting data, you know, by very interested developers to have very little space. And, you know, we're increasing, you know, it's like, and the developers want to have less parking so they can have more density. And I just, I just don't know how, I, I just really urge the board not to go there. I think a lot of town councilors won't support that. Um, we need to be careful about increasing density, the mixed use buildings, increased density. We did it years ago. We didn't have design standards. We didn't protect historic buildings. You know, the master plan t tells us to, you know, look at things in a nuanced way. And I think that this is just a path that we're going to go down. And I don't have any data. Like when I say that bus use ridership is down every year and someone says, oh, well, people are just using, you know, it's just, you know, where's your information coming from, you know, and people are going to be buying EVs and going electric. And so there's, you know, the environmental thing, we're going to have self-driving cars, seniors who can't drive now will be driving more. Americans aren't cutting back on car use. There's just no data supporting that. And so, you know, I would just say, let's just pu pull this out of here and let's get some information and, and really look at the parking issue. It may be different in different parts of town. We can do that, but we need to base it on information, not just ideas and hopes. Sure, thanks, also, we just need to see how those buildings work that we permitted. We really didn't know what the effects are. You know, everybody might be in the parking lot of Florence Bank every night, just the way people are always in the parking lot at 11 East Pleasant Street now from, from 1 East Pleasant Street. So right. is yeah. it true that, that UMass students can have uh, overnight parking? Under the campus? first year students, first year stu freshmen cannot have cars. And it used to be um, that, yeah. So I, I think only freshmen, actually, no, maybe freshmen can because my cousin's daughter had a car. Yeah. So let me try to But think. If, like graduate students, can they have their car there, uh, you know, 24 seven parked? Is oh, that, you, does anybody know about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, UMass has, you know, number of parking lots. So there's different rates for parking lot. And then there's also a waiting list for certain lots. So I think it's a matter of what you're willing to pay and what the convenience is. How far away are you parking your car from where you're living or where you're going to your classroom building? So, um, you know, Jan, I will say that the parking piece, you know, Northampton actually has changed some of their parking and they actually really put it on the developer to say, okay, here's what the demand is for this project. And they have to show how they're going to meet that. And so without prescribing it's two units for space, it's really like, you know, if we know how many parking permits are being pulled for certain developments, right, I agree. You know, if we look at the data for existing and new developments and say, okay, on average, a third of the units or whatever, you know, what percentage is pulling permits or have cars, then you know we need to ask the developer to say okay, if you if you're having you know 100 bedrooms and we know there's going to be 40 cars, and we don't require parking or we can waive it with this provision, tell us where those 40 cars are parking. They need to have the lease agreements or shared parking agreements with the neighbors. I mean, we allowed shared parking in the bylaw, but I don't think people do a very good job of doing that. Yeah, I, don't I think, think that, I think that should, yeah. I think that should go to the site plan review and make it much easier. But also, we're building buildings for like 50 years, and so. You know, we may have undergraduates at one, you know, one East Pleasant now, but what if they're families and they do need cars? So, it, you know, we're taking a snapshot in time, but we don't know what car use is going to be, but we don't even know what car use is right now. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I know when I drive around, there's a lot of very full lots and some, you know, I know that low income housing has fewer cars because obviously people can't afford cars, but I don't know, I don't have, I mean, we need some information before we make radical changes like this. 
you know, and this is, and the other thing is, is this exception in apartments and mixed use, what does it do? We already have a waiver in Article 7, and what's the relationship between those two? Just from a legal point of view, I was just like, why, why do we have a parking requirement or waiver or language in a use table when we have an entire bylaw called Article 7 about parking? It's just, it's kind of, I thought the purpose of recodifying was to get the, the bylaw more organized, not more odd, you know. So, I mean, let's take this idea, let's look at Article 7 and look at it in a, in a coherent way, but basically based on data, you know, we just don't know what, you know. But yeah, also, I'm, just, I'm just looking up that article um, that the housing choice folks are referencing. And I know it was, um, oh geez. Um, that was the metro area of Boston. You're right, right. So I think, you know. But that was data-based. That was data from the area it was from. We don't have this. And so, you know, Chris Brestrup had said this, I, I think a year ago, I've lost track, maybe a year and a half. We need to do some studies. And I don't know where, I just don't know. I, I, I don't know why this popped in, but I wish it hadn't, you know, and I think we have to look yeah. at this with article seven. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think when we did the site visit for uh, 11 or 13 East Pleasant Street, you know, folks were walking from yeah. one East Pleasant Street to their cars in the lot that is going to be gone. Uh, can, I, so can I clarify so. that at least two of us arrived on bicycles? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I Johanna, on, that, that's, I that's a cyclist there. But I true. walked home. I walked home. <laughs> Andrew likely would have walked as well. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, if we want to discuss more about parking, I, I, but this mixed use has, you know, a small piece um, in that regard. Um, Chris Brestrup, would you like to chime in here about parking? And because I guess it's it's interwoven it's interwoven into a number of the bylaws that we're looking at the discussion that we're having now is the same discussion that we have when we look at various developments we had this discussion at Amir's property on southeast street we had the discussion about robleski's property i think what this paragraph does is it gives us a little bit more clarity about what kinds of things the planning board should be looking at when it decides whether it's going to um, require a certain number of parking spaces per dwelling unit or a certain number of parking spaces per development. I think we get stuck on the idea of we have to have two spaces per dwelling unit because that's what the bylaw says. And we don't have much guidance about how can we evaluate that for the particular uh, development that's being proposed. So I, I currently think this is a good idea to include it in the um, mixed use building and apartment standards. And I do also think that we need to study our article seven and we need to do some studies about parking or do some research to find out what, what is reasonable. But I think two spaces per dwelling unit is not reasonable, especially when you have um, some of these dwelling units that have one, one, one bedroom or their studios, or even if they have two bedrooms. Um, you know, anyway, there's a lot to be said about parking, but I think it's reasonable to include these paragraphs in this mixed use. I'm also noting that the um, time is like, it's after 7.30 and we still have two other zoning bylaws that we wanna hear about and discuss. So we might wanna move on or at least maybe take some public comment and then move on to the next item. And, you know, you'll have a chance in the future to come back to this. Jack, could I could I just jump in for a second? Sure. Could this can we can we take this language and move it into Article Seven and discuss that with the waiver the current waiver language maybe at a different time? I just I don't know why you know it just seems logical to put it there, and maybe we want, we want to be more specific about factors for a waiver than the current language in Article Seven. But I think this is going to create, I think it's just chaotic, but I also think it's going to create a conflict between 
the use table for apartments and mixed use, and then the, the other waiver language. So I think if we put it all in the same spot, we can kind of <coughs> it. So that's my recommendation. Thank you. And uh, before we move on, I have one last comment about the open space and its requirement when the property is fairly intimate with, uh, or very proximal to public recreation areas, uh, like we're seeing at 11 uh, East Pleasant Street with Kendrick Park right across the street. I'm just wondering if there's, there might be like a, you know, a radius um, uh, adder given, you know, if there's, if you're right, you know, if a park is right next to you, it just seems like open space at that lot probably is not uh, as important as a remote lot that is far away from, from recreation areas. Um, anybody else have anything on, on uh, the mixed use? Okay, so we can go to public uh, comment. And I see Ira's hand and Pam Rooney. Ira, state your name and address, please. Hi, Ira. Hi, how are you? Very good. I'm Ira Brick, 255 Strong Street. I have just three comments. One is on the open space, which I think there was a, a version. Now the version says project open space shall include areas for occupants and visitors of the building and site. It was my impression in the beginning of these discussions that the idea of open space would be more for public ability to uh, congregate and have, you know, just downtown be a place to meet and greet. Um, in fact, I see an earlier version where it's crossed out and areas for use by the public. So I don't know what happened to that, but it almost seems like developers are coming in and making changes here. It's nothing is going in the direction of the public, including, I have to say, there's not a bunch of retail, as one of you said before in that building. It is a tiny piece of retail. I was just wondering today what percentage of the square footage that store is. We really are turning downtown into nothing that people are going to use if you don't live there and go to college there. And as far as the parking goes, if you say that the price of gas is $3 a gallon and you don't charge people for the fact that we are destroying the planet in the process and the real price of gas should include the remediation of that, then the real price of these buildings happening, the real cost to the developers, no offense to developers, should include that they are taking away the parking that this town needs. I would be all for a carless society. I live a mile and a half from town and I walk to town every day. And I ride my bike. I don't like using my car. My car gets 54 miles to the gallon. But if I wanna go and lift something, I'm 68 years old, I need my car. And it seems like the developers are getting quite a deal in not having to supply adequate parking. I support what Northampton is doing of actually asking the developers, how many cars do you expect? Because we should add that to the cost of what you need to do to make this project happen. If people wanna build an Amherst, they can't hurt the town in the process. And I know you're working really hard to create right bylaws to make us thrive, but we're not going to thrive just from tax revenue. We're gonna thrive because downtown is great. So thank you so much. Thanks, Ira. Uh, Elizabeth, state your name and address, please. Hi, Elizabeth. Can you unmute yourself? No. Yeah, we hear you. Oh, you can? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, Elizabeth Verling, 36 Cottage Street. Um, and I just wanted to speak to a couple of things. One was I'd like to push back on the idea that uh, developments can get away with using town open space instead of providing their own open space. I don't think that that's appropriate. I think that 
the town should not give the developer the open space that that there should be additional open space the open space in the town is for everyone and um, we should have additional open space associated with any new buildings um, i also just wanted to comment that yes it would be wonderful if we could all walk downtown and do everything we wanted to do there but that's we already know that's not the case um, because there are not sufficient town amenities to serve all our needs. Uh, I also want to re-emphasize a point I've tried to make previously, which is about bikeability. Triangle Street, which is right in downtown, um, right at thoroughfare into downtown, is not bikeable. Um, or it is bikeable if you want to take your life in your hands. Um, and something needs to be considered if you really want bikeable um, parts of Amherst. Uh, and I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next, we have Doroth, or excuse me, Pam Rooney. Pam uh, state Rooney. your name and address, please. Hi, Pam. Hello, Pam. Pam Rooney, uh, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, I have one technical question. And I, I wonder if after I'm finished, if somebody could address this. Um, I, the section 12.341, it talks about parking as a potentially a principal use or an accessory use. And I would love to have some clarification of when does parking serve a, an accessory use and when is it a, a principal use. Um, I want to add to the voices that have at least expressed some positivity for the, the section on open space. Uh, actually, Mr. Brick stated quite well the fact that we've been pushing to try to make sure that uh, there's an interface for the public and you know some way to engage with these buildings um, that I, I love the idea of requiring a bit more open space that is in fact not only um, in, uh, pervious so that you've got some you've got some penetration of rainwater and you've got some ability to to have some green space on the site but uh, what I was in what I was seeing on the 11 East Pleasant Street is that there is really no, no place for anyone visitor public or otherwise to actually sit on that um, in a very limited front plaza so I think this this inclusion of having some uh, required open space uh, is is an important one. Um, the parking, uh, very good discussion on parking here tonight, and I think I would I would probably also weigh in on the idea of maybe rather than, um, or I should say, it it sounds like the same kind of parking paragraph is also being discussed for inclusion in the apartment definition and 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 it does really feel like parking ought to get pulled out and these nice factors you know what you should consider should in fact be considered all uh wrapped up in the in in section seven where we can look at it holistically and again it's we're really good at kind of trying to address specific problems and specific topics but sometimes you it, it is very helpful to step back and try to look at something as a package and holistically. Um, I, I wanted to just double check it, that I heard properly um, also on the, on the open space that in that paragraph that it says project open space should be areas that are not parking areas or driveways. So I'm, I'm assuming or interpreting that to mean that in the future, the, the Von Erf driveway slash um, courtyard that was described last night at the DRB, in fact, doesn't, doesn't um, meet a, an open space requirement. And I would strongly agree with that. It is a driveway. It is not a community space for the, for the uh, residents of that building. This is one East Pleasant Street. Um, and then again, support the fact that uh, it sounds like the planning board as well as the design review board can apply the standards and conditions of section 3.2040 and 2.201. If somebody could accept that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Dorothy, Pam, 
What's next? Was Nate going to was Nate going to respond to that, or you you don't respond at all, right? Uh, we can. Uh, the principal versus secondary. Excuse me, um, Nate. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I'll go. I'll go in uh, the, uh, you know, the order. Um, the Warner and that's interesting. I would assume that that does not meet the product open space because it is used by cars. And so, you know, maybe someone is going to say that that is a model where it's both for cars and and people. But um, I don't think it functions that way here. Um, and you know, I'm going through the rest of your comments. I think staff will have to consider, you know, the parking issue. I do think there's a lot there about what's being said and how to deal with parking. Um, as a principal or accessory use, so, you know, an accessory use is if there's parking provided by residents or, um, you know, for the for business, right? And then we allow parking as a principal use if it's, um, you know, it's a standalone use. So if it's not necessarily associated with a use in the building. Um, you know, or, or incidental to that use. So if it's not, you know, customer parking or resident parking. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the difference between principal and accessory. Thank you. Um, Dorothy Pan, please uh, state your name and address. Hi, Dorothy. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to refocus your attention a little bit about the park. Um, the park is something that the town has been working on for a long time. It's been using town money for, and um, has put playground equipment in, as well as benches and places for small performances, aiming at uh, appealing to a large group of people who were not the residents of a few new buildings across the street, but the town of Amherst. And I've been a mother and grandmother for over 50 years, and I, I truly am an expert in transporting children. What we've been forgetting about is many people coming to the park will have to park a car. They're coming with a couple of kids. They're not coming on a bike. Um, at least I'm not. And we need, I mean, we're losing some parking places with the redesign of the park. So we need some parking for people coming to the park. The park was not put there so that the new buildings wouldn't have to have parking, all right? Um, and we need also to think about the buildings as being flexible. Uh, now they're think we have this, this need for dormitories and people who live in dorms, it means they sleep there and they have their life is somewhere else, okay? It's on campus. Thank goodness we're gonna be totally open, we hope. So, um, but even they still need some space outdoors that's kind of half theirs, half the public um, to, to, to have some space. So we really must keep uh, space and parking. You also mentioned the customers for the retail. Um, some of them will have to park their cars. They're not gonna park in the underneath the, in the first floor. So we just have to realize that people coming to the park, some of them will have cars. People coming to the store, some of them will have cars. Not, so we're not just gonna talk about how many people who live in that building have cars. Okay, it's part of a whole fabric of downtown. And we do have to come up and have make sure that, that all the parking places aren't taken away because we wish that people didn't need them. We have to have some cars or else it'll be just a dead space and a dead park. And we will have wasted a lot of public money. So thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. And I see no other hands raised. Um, so any other comments from the, the board members? If not, we can move on to the apartments section. Yeah, thanks, I everyone. see none. Oh. No, I was just thanking everyone. This is a good conversation. Oh, okay, so Nate, are you signing off or? No, I'm, I'm, I'm uh... Well, I'm still gonna stay here, but I don't, I, you know, I, Maureen is presenting apartments and then Ben is doing the, um, okay. know, with the demolition delay, but uh, I'll be in the background. I'll, I'll come back in a second. Okay, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, so on to proposed changes to apartments, section 3.323 of the zoning bylaw definition standards and criteria and proposed change to parking requirements. Uh, section 7.00 of the zoning bylaw for apartments. All right. Uh, Maureen, welcome. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jack. Uh, thanks, everyone. 
So um, yeah, I'm here today tonight to talk about uh, a pro uh, proposed zoning amendments for um, the uh, related to apartments, including the definition and the uh, standards and conditions. Um, and so I wanted to walk you through uh, what are the current, what is the current definition and the current standards and definitions, and then. Um, and then uh, introduce what the planning department is proposing for zoning amendments. So in this slide, this shows you the existing apartment definition. Uh, it's a residential use consisting of one or more buildings, each building containing no fewer than three, no more than 24 dwelling units. Uh, apartment dwelling units may share internal access ways and entrances and need not have separate exterior entrances on the ground level. Um, th this slide uh, shows uh, section 3.323 under the use regulations um, for, and so these are the standards and conditions for apartments. Um, the first bullet talks about development location uh, the site or lot upon which one or more apartment buildings are proposed shall be located uh, closely to uh, a heavily traveled street or streets, close to a business, uh, commercial, or residential district, or in a area already developed for multifamily use. And in that case, multifamily use would be uh, two or more um, dwelling units. Um, and then the second bullet is units per building each building shall have no fewer than three, no more than 24 dwelling units. Uh, there needs to be uh, sewer connections for each of the buildings. Um, and then on uh, the, the, the apartment um, development would need to meet all dimensional regulations um, under article six. And uh, this slide continues with uh, standards and conditions. Um, this shows, um, in, um, there are certain uh, additional dimensional regulations in addition to table three um, in uh, the RG, the BL, the BVC and the BN, there's a requirement for additional side and rear yard uh, setbacks per, per floor, which would be two feet per each floor um, would be applied on top of the, uh, the general side and rear setbacks. And then in the, the BN zoning district, uh, there is a floor area ratio uh, requirement of uh, 0.3. And that looks at um, the floor area ratio is the ratio of the gross floor area of all, all buildings on the site to the lot area. Um, and so that would dictate sort of the, the bulk and mass of the building. And then also in the BN, there's a requirement for a minimum of 40% of landscape or natural open space. And in this slide, it sort of uh, explains, well, what is landscaped or natural open space? And, and it gets into, you know, those area portions of the lot devoted to, to plantings, including lawns and grass areas, wooded land and pedestrian oriented paved or unpaved areas devoted to social or recreational use in common by the residents of the building or complex, provided that such areas are kept essentially open to the outdoors in are at the ground level. And so the uh, landscape or natural open space would, would not uh, include um, areas devoted to parking, access, and service drives. Um, and uh, I, uh, just as another note, um, the BN district, I believe, is a new zoning district that was approved back in 2012. And so um, that's why you see um, there's a, uh, I, I believe the apartment section was amended with that new zoning district. So that's why that has sort of these special added um, comments here. And then the standards and conditions continue on the next slide. Um, the bedroom count um, uh, section or, or standard um, was actually, it was uh, the same language uh, that exists, that does exist for the mixed use uh, building. Um, and spoiler alert, we're, we're proposing that that this section be uh, amended to match the mixed use building um, uh, standards for bedroom counts. So this says no more than 50% of the total number of dwelling units shall be of any one size uh, for projects 
in which all dwelling units provided other than those occupied by, by a resident manager are affordable. The per permit granting board or special uh, special permit granting authority authorized to act under the applicable section of the bylaw for this use may waive or modify this requirement. And then the next bullet is uh, regarding management plans. Um, it, it, um, it, the section says, um, you know, it need, it, they need to submit a management <coughs> plan and that's, it, it's an integral part of the application process. And here, um, the final bullet here says, uh, gets into design review principles and standards. And it talks about how how um, the apartment use would need uh, would need to conform with um, the the, DR, the design review principles and standards under uh, sec, uh, Article Three. And then um, apartments by zoning district. So uh, the planning staff and I thought it would be useful to um, ha show a little comparison of where apartments are allowed in comparison of the mixed use building. And um, so this uh, slide uh, will show you the, the comparison. So, um, but I, I'll just uh, mention the apartment section. So the, in the village center residence district, it's allowed by special permit, um, as well as in the general residence and the limited business district in the village center business in the neighborhood business zoning district. It's allowed by site plan review in the general business district and it's not allowed in the commercial district. And then at the bottom, it shows um, districts that apartments in mixed use buildings are not allowed, um, period. Um, and this slide shows, this map shows, uh, is a town-wide map and shows you all the zoning districts uh, that allow apartments and um, so we'll, we'll uh, zoom into each of those uh, areas in town that allow apartments. So at the Atkins Corner Village Center, which is along West and West Bay Road, um, uh, these parcels that are contained in the Village Center business uh, allow, allow apartments. Um, this slide shows that um, there is uh, the business of Village, uh, the village center business, um, it's one parcel uh, located at the corner of Belchertown Road and um, Gatehouse Road, allows apartments. Uh, this map shows um, the downtown area. Um, and so apartments um, are allowed in, in, you know, the RVC, the RG, the BVC, the BL, the BN, and the BG. But um, so you can see, you know, obviously uh, the BG is, is the downtown um, downtown area and the, you know, the surrounding RG zoning district and then along um, Route 9 all the way down to um, North and Southeast Street uh, where, you know, Florence Savings Bank, Auto Express, Spirit House, Hadley Cleaners, um, those sorts of businesses are located there. And then um, over here on the west side of downtown, um, uh, you, uh, along University Drive in the limited business district, uh, apartments are allowed. Um, and then this next map shows North Amherst. Um, it's uh, apartments are allowed in the village center residence in the village center business, which um, these, these uh, zones or these parcels within these zones are along the um, Meadow Street and uh, North Pleasant Street. Um, and um, as a landmark, uh, the North Amherst Library is located at that intersection. Uh, and at the Pomeroy Village Center, um, apartments are allowed in the Village Center residents in the Village Center Business District. Um, and this is, you know, um, the parcels uh, surrounding the intersection of West in West Street and um, Pomeroy in West Pomeroy Lane. And where the new uh, intersection improvements will be located. Um, here uh, is a list of recently approved apartments. Um, the presidential apartments located at 950 North Pleasant Street uh, recently uh, gained approval for providing 54 additional apartments. Um, at Aspen Heights at 408 Northampton Road, um, that was recently approved for uh, a, a one building with 88 units, which um, is finishing up construction as we speak. 
uh, South Point Apartments at 266 East Hampton Road uh, was recently approved for additional building with 47 units and uh, Valley CDC uh, recently was approved a, uh, a comprehensive permit of 40B at 132 Northampton Road um, to build um, a, a one, a one building which would contain 28 apartment dwellings. And so there is a theme here. Um, and if you, you know, return back to the definition of apartments, you, you know, um, it's no, uh, the, the amount of dwellings is, is no fewer than three and no more than 24. But as you can see, these ones have more than that. And so, um, um, and they, uh, many of them, I think uh, th three out of four um, are, you know, pre-existing non-conforming lots or buildings. And so it provided them flexibility to have these uh, amount of dwellings and then the comprehensive uh, permit allowed um, more density. And so typically, uh, you know, uh, historic, uh, in, in recent years, you know, the planning department has not seen uh, apartments being proposed because it is very limiting um, uh, with the sort of the minimum and the maximum of, of dwellings allowed per, per building. And so these are sort of the exceptions of the rules. Um, and other communities, so I took a look at other communities, how they define uh, apartments and uh, um, I have, well, let's see here, one, two, three, five communities that I looked at. And once one theme I noticed is that uh, many, is that these communities among others that I looked into don't actually call, uh, don't define um, this use as apartments, but rather as uh, multifamily uses. Um, and that was one um, theme that was across the board. Um, but each of these um, columns, there's a column about three units and uh, what, uh, and then what, how many units would define a multifamily uh, dwelling. And so um, in some towns like Northampton and Greenfield, they actually have a, a use, a three unit dwelling or a triplex. And in uh, Natick, Montague and East Hampton, they don't. And then, um, and then these communities define um, multifamily um, by a, a different amount of density. So in Northampton, it's four units plus, Greenfield also four units plus, Natick three units plus, Montague three units plus, and East Hampton two units plus. And as a reminder, in, in Amherst, it's at three units plus with a maximum of 24 units. And uh, so another theme here is a consistent theme is that none of these um, communities actually uh, put a cap on how many units would be allowed per per um, per building, um, and then this just gives you um, just the exact you know the wording of, of their of their definitions, um, and so recommendations for zoning amendments. Uh, we decided well there could be a lot lot of things to change so we would want to put this in phases and so the planning department recommends two phases of exploring proposals the first phase would be uh, to remove the maximum number of units allowed per building opposed to having a maximum of 24 units per building update the standards and conditions regarding bedroom count management plan and perhaps parking um, revise the permitting path to allow apartments by special permit in the general business uh, district and by site plan review in the village uh, center uh, village center residence and um, the reasoning for this would be that you know the general business zoning district as the word would imply is really focusing on businesses and so we thought that perhaps it would be make more sense to, you know, make it um, to, instead of doing site plan review to, to um, require a special permit um, and, and um, you know, make it more onerous for the developer in the BG and um, for the village center residents that, you know, those words would imply that we're promoting more residential uses. So we would wanna make it easier for applicants um, 
that are proposing apartments by site plan review. And then in phase two, um, we, uh, the planning department would wanna explore redefining the use and the definition of apartments to multifamily dwellings. And we would want to look at that in uniform of other residential uses, such as, um, you know, a converted dwelling, uh, townhouses, and, you know, if, if the town um, wanted to look at, um, you know, providing a, a triplex use. Um, and also there is a, another layer of, of how that terminology would um, affect uh, assessor use classifications. So it, 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 I think it might require a, a sort of more thorough examination of just is, is changing the name, what is sort of the ripple effect or is there, um, what would that actually entail or would there be any sort of uh, effect that, um, that we're not aware of? And then the second would be adjust the minimum number of units allowed per building from three units to four units and to create a new use classification and definition for a three unit dwelling um, known as a triplex. And um, if you want, I have, I have um, the draft language. Would that be something that I should show? Yeah, I was thinking like uh, before you show that and uh, we take questions, maybe taking a break right now. We've been taking a little five minute break. Would that be okay, Maureen? With you? Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay. So Pam, you want to set that up? Yep, so it's 8.07. So okay. um, five and seven is 12. Do you want to round up to 8.15 or do you want to be at 12? What would um, like? Yeah, 815 would be great. 815, we'll see you then. All right.
Hi, Jack. Are we the only one? Well, I see Doug. Him. Tom, Johanna, Maria. I think we have everyone. If uh, <clears throat> Maureen. Maureen. We're back. <laughs> yes. So um, you were going to. Yeah, uh, did we want to go through the um, uh, proposed uh, draft language first okay. or take comments? Um, is that in our package? Um, yes. No. I believe so. Okay, yeah. So go, why don't you go ahead uh, and do that? Okay. Whoops. Okay. Okay. So let me scroll up. Okay. So, all right. Okay. So, um, so this is the draft language uh, regarding apartments. Um, you can see that uh, in green, uh, green lettering that's bold with italics represents proposed language. Uh, red lettering with bold and strike through, uh, a strike through indicates uh, it being removed. Um, let's see if I can make this bigger. And so uh, this first section here is Article 12 is the definitions. It's part of the zoning bylaw. And um, the planning department is proposing that we uh, remove uh, the maximum amount of units uh, allowed. Uh, currently, it says no more than 24 dwelling units. And so we're proposing to remove the, the maximum amount. And then here, um, st as, uh, um, starting with Article 3, use regulations. Um, and section 3.323 is, is the section on apartments. And uh, this chart shows you all the different uh, uh, zoning districts that allow apartments. And we're proposing changing um, in the, uh, let's see here, the village center residence zoning district uh, currently allows apartments by special permit. We're proposing that it would be allowed by site plan review. And then in the general business zoning district, it's currently allowed by uh, site plan review, and we're proposing it to be allowed by special permit. Um, this is uh, the beginning of the standards and conditions uh, for apartments. And um, this paragraph um, where uh, it gets into what's the minimum amount, maximum amount of dwelling units allowed in each building and uh, again uh, we're going to strike through the language about um, having the maximum amount of, of dwelling units at 24 so there would be no maximum amount um, and let's see here we'll scroll down the bedroom count um, section uh, we're proposing that it would be uh, it, be consistent uh, with the language being proposed for the mixed use uh, mixed use uh, building um, and uh, so the new language would say no more than 50% of the total number of dwelling units shall have the same uh, bedroom count with the exception of an apartment building containing less than five units. The permit granting authority may waive or modify this requirement for project in which all dwelling units provided are affordable. See Article 12, affordable housing. And, uh, you know, as Nate had indicated, this is just cleaning it up. Um, you know the 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 mention in in re it, that the 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 language that we are striking through um, is still being captured in the green. It's just saying it in a cleaner fashion. Um, the management plan. So um, we're actually we're proposing that this section be struck through. Not that we don't think a management plan should be provided. It it definitely should be provided and is actually a requirement of all um, special permits and site plan review um, review applications. And so this is sort of redundant and um, um, and it's just saving saving a, a little a sentence or two in, in, in the, our, our, our large zoning bylaw. And, um, and so it, it, again, it's redundant. And I believe that at one time, 
um, our, you know, ZBA and planning board applications didn't require management plans. And so that was why this was um, written in. And so, but since then, it's a, it's a, a, a requirement for all special permit and sp site plan review applications. Um, and this is uh, our, the proposed section on parking, which is the same language that uh, Nate walked you through during the mixed use building um, section of tonight. Uh, and I, I guess I'll just repeat it. Adequate parking shall be provided. The amount of parking spaces provided for each apartment dwelling unit shall be based on factors, including, but not limited to bedroom counts, analysis, analysis of traffic input, impact reports, proximity to downtown, proximity to public transit, proximity to public parking, including on-street and off-street parking, availability of alternative modes of transportation, uh, tenant lease restrictions relative to parking and shared or leased parking as regulated in, um, in accordance with uh, section 7.2. And um, as Chris had said earlier, you know, the thinking behind this was <clears throat> that this gives um, the permit granting authority more direction of, of uh, telling the applicant the, this is the kind of information that we need for you to prove to us that you only need to provide, you know, one parking sp space per uh, unit. And, you know, they would, they would take this list and build their case to, to um, provide evidence to the, the, you know, the planning board or, or the zoning board of appeals. And both boards, I would say, the both boards have the discretionary power to say, you know, no, and in, in fact, uh, you know, you provided this information, but we still feel that there should be two parking spaces per dwelling unit, or they could say, you know what, it does make sense. You have evidence, and we're we're going to put in um, conditions, specific conditions that would that would address any sort of concern, and perhaps maybe even come back in a year or periodically. To um, to prove um, and reevaluate the parking situation, um, and so um, I just wanted to clarify, just sort of sort of scenario playing of how how this could work out. But I, I definitely hear everyone's comments, um, and I, I understand that. And let's see here. And so um, this is Article Seven, parking and access regulations. And so this is where it would. Um, um, would address uh, Article 7 a little bit. I did not include 7.9, which is about waivers and modifications, but this is this uh, 7.000 is uh, the parking requirement for dwellings. And currently it says uh, for dwellings, including apartments. And so the proposal is that we would strike th that through uh, where it says including apartments. And uh, under 7.0000, two parking spaces uh, for each dwelling unit, excluding apartments and mixed use buildings um, as regulated in accordance with Article 3, which then brings you back up here uh, because this is part of um, uh, Article 3. So, and um, that's, that's it that I have. So I'm, I'm eager to hear everyone's thoughts. So let me um, take this down. Thank you so much, Maureen. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> um, like to hear from Doug. All right, thanks, Jack. And thanks, Maureen. Glad to have another chance to talk about this with you. Um, looks like we are making some headway. Um, I was uh, Pleased to see that you included all those plans of the uh, areas in town where apartments are allowed. And I was interested to see your list of recent apartments that have been approved. Because if I, unless I'm, I think I'm not wrong, but at least three, if not all of those, are in areas that, that apartments are not allowed in. And I think that's telling. Um, you know, we've got a lot of controversy about uh, developers building what are essentially apartment buildings with a little bit of retail 
in the downtown, but we don't have a lot of other places where they seem to want to build apartments uh, as of right. And, um, you know, I think we ought to have a talk about where do we want apartments for students to be built? And we don't seem to want to, I'm not quite sure how we get there or how I, I uh, nip at everybody's heels to have that conversation, but I think it's worth having because there's clearly a desire to build apartments and the only place that they seem to be able to do it down, is downtown. And if that's a problem, then let's find where, it, where it's not a problem. Um, so the fact that you listed, showed all those areas uh, causes me to wanna talk about maybe extending the, you know, where apartments are allowed into the office park area at the south end of, of University Drive. Um, you know, I think we ought to have a talk about the zone, the zones, and I assume you don't want to have that tonight. Maybe that's phase two or even phase three. Um, so on, on the, the material you've presented, um, you had that one table where you showed us that, uh, there's this additional side and rear yards, uh, setbacks required, um, depending on the, the number of stories. Um, I, I'm not sure I agree with that. It seems to me that um, in many areas, if we want to have more housing, we ought to let it conform to the regular setbacks that we've set for that zone. So, so I'm not, you know, I, I lived in a building for a long time that was probably three feet from the residential building next to it and we got along fine. So um, I'm not sure I, that I would keep all those two feet that you've got. And then I think at least in your presentation, it, it was a little bit unclear whether the minimum landscape, 40% uh, and the, the, whether that's only in the BN, because you said that, but it wasn't anywhere in the text. So, um, I, I, I wanted to look at where, where the BN is, and it's not clear that there are very, that there's very much of it anywhere. So uh, that seemed like a lot of emphasis on something that barely exists. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Maureen? Uh, yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Doug. Um, so I'll start with the BN um, and add that Looking at the, the the requirements for the BN, um, uh, planning staff feel that that deserves a discussion, and perhaps that would be phase three, <laughs> um, perhaps, and that we didn't want to explore that now because, and I, I'm happy to pull up the map, but it, it it is only a small amount of parcels, maybe ten parcels or less, and it's along Main Street and Triangle. Um, where like Amherst Media is be, uh, was permitted and that sort of that little block right there. So it's not a big impact, if you will. Um, so we didn't want to explore it, but um, points well taken about the additional uh, setbacks. And yeah, the 40% um, the minimum uh, open space requirement in the BN it, it, or, the, uh, or yeah, that open space requirement is solely just for the BN. It's not for any other district. And um, let's see what else. Um, uh, note take, taken about um, you know considering uh, expanding apartments in the uh, office park, uh, um, office districts along University Drive. We we could explore that in the future, and um, and and uh, also your first note about uh, needing to talk about where students uh, should should live in, in town, um, you know, that could be something that the planning department could look into in the future, not now, but in the future at some point. I, I would like to just clarify, I, I cited that office park area as one example. Mm -hmm. I think there are other areas where we could allow apartments that, that we don't now mm -hmm. without too much trouble. Mm -hmm. Very good, um, Janet. So um, I agree with Doug um, and his attempts 
his the conversation that we need to have about like where the different zoning districts and where things can go and as he was talking i was remembering that when we when the planning board was asked you know what are our zoning priorities it was downtown planning housing and then working on recodifying the bylaw which you know those are big things to bite off and chew and we're kind of we're kind of doing it um kind of coming in a little bit through the back door so I have, I feel like I, I'm kind of lacking context and um, I kind of want to scope back and get a bigger view is, I don't, why do I would, I would love some information about why there's a 24 unit per building requirement to start with. Like what was the thinking, like when was that adopted and what's the thinking behind it? <clears throat> um, and so, you know, my, I have guesses from looking around, you know, the different apartment complexes that are in South Amherst that it had to be with, you know, family space, green space, livability, not wanting to have, you know, large apartment buildings and kind of breaking it up and kind of maybe more of a village or a town style. That's my guess. But I just, I would love that the planning department could sort of, you know, like, what was the rationale for it? And, you know, you know, what's, what's the good parts of that? Um, um, you know, it's, it was probably adopted, you know, years ago, I'm just interested. And I also have like the question I always like to ask is what is the problem that we're trying to solve and what are different ways to get to the, like, what's your goal? Like, what's the problem? What's your goal? And what are the different ways to get there? Um, so, you know, we're sort of taking the unit cap off apartments, which is a big increase in density, kind of like we did with multi um, use buildings. And I think sort of one of the problems with that is that you know, you gave an increase of in density, but you didn't ask for anything in exchange like inclusionary zoning you know, um, maybe some environmental, you know, regulate, you know, additions or solar heating or, you know, different, you know, kind of different things. And so I wonder if that's going to happen. Um, sort of looking back, I would love to see a comparison between mixed use building requirements against apartments currently, and then the two proposed changes, because I'm beginning to wonder what's the difference between the two. And then, um, I also like to see the different, like a chart that says, here's the difference between the legal requirements for site plan review and um, special permit. So if we're going from A to, you know, site plan review to special permit or one direction or the other, I think we have, a, the planning board really needs to have just the hit list. You know, there, there's different appeals, appeal times, there's different legal requirements. A lot of them overlap, but they don't all. And so I think that would be really helpful whenever we talk about doing that shift. And so I'd like to see that. And then I would love to see like us thinking about like what, or the planning department or all, all of us thinking about like, what are the possible impacts down the road? Um, there could be great impacts, there could be negative impacts and there might be different impacts in different parts of town. And so, you know, it's like, I can't, I would just, I wanna know like what, what's, you know, like what's gonna happen in two years or three years? Like what does loosening this requirement do? It may do nothing since we're actually allowing large apartment buildings in PRP and office park, maybe it will pull apartments into the village centers, but we also, we have never delineated our village centers and we've never planned our village centers. We've never designed our village centers or had, you know, design guidelines. And so um, I just want to have some long conversation or some, you know, information or like speculative, and it doesn't have to always be negative or positive, but like, what could be the impacts? Like, is there a specific impact that might hit RG or downtown differently? Like, as I sit here, I was thinking, well, maybe people, you know, all these people want to build housing downtown and they're just putting in this, you know, they're doing multi-use because buildings, because they can get more density than apartments. And that's why they have this little storefront, you know, and so maybe they'll just start building apartments and then we'll be losing storefronts as buildings, you know, turn over and things like that. And so, I'd like to think about that before we endorse a change. I'd like to understand where we're going. So that's a long list. Sorry about that. But I, I do think, like, I think I want to know, like, the, the setting and then the consequences and then the legal, the comparison between mixed use and apartments, because it's, it's seeming like less and less to me. And maybe that's good. You know, maybe that's where we need to head. But I just, I just want to see, you know, I don't kind of get the difference anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. 
Um, I could uh, address the first question, which is the rationale for 40, uh, for 24 uh, dwelling units as a maximum per building. I believe that came out of the 1970s and, and Chris, uh, please help chime in. Um, and I, I think it was in response of a lot of apartment bu buildings being built in the 70s sort of in a, in a quick fashion and um, that the, the town um, proposed the, the, the maximum um, to sort of limit the, uh, the density of, of, of the buildings being built back in the 70s. Um, I don't know if Chris has anything else to add to that. Are they specific yeah. buildings in town that do you think? Um, so like Colonial Village, um, the, the, the um, well, the, the presidential um, and South Point apartments. Um, so in essence, sort of the build, the buildings that I had mentioned in those in, in that slide, some of those examples were about adding, um, it wasn't from, from starting from scratch, it was actually adding more buildings. So yeah, so South Point, Presidential and Colonial Village um, would be sort of um, your classic uh, apartment buildings being built back then. And let's see here. Um, yeah, uh, about what's the difference between mixed use and apartments uh, for the proposals, uh, we could certainly show you, uh, you know, uh, a comparison in like a ch in a chart or, or whatever would make sense for you to see, see the see the difference there. Um, and again, it, it's, it's, it's really the differences are about standards and conditions. Um, um, the use obviously would be different. Um, and uh, and what's the difference between um, uh, the 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 requirements for a site plan review versus the requirements for a special permit? Um, we could certainly provide you a comparison. Um, and what's the impact in two or three years? Um, or ten? Or, or ten. ten? Or ten? Or oh, yeah, no, yeah. Um, well, you know, we're hoping that 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 uh, there will be, you know more ideal uh, apartment buildings um, that have stronger design standards and, and as well as the mixed use uh, building section as well. Um, you know, we've noticed that, you know, there's the, the classic example that I've been giving about where I wonder if, if the developer um, could have uh, could have built an apartment, would he have? So there's a uh, 70 University Drive, which was recently approved and now built. It's a mixed use building with a, with a very small retail space of about 300 square feet. And, you know, I, I don't know how many apartment, uh, how many units is proposed, but it is more than 24. You know, you, you would, you would make sort of, um, you would question I wonder if that developer would have proposed an apartment building there, but he couldn't because he had the maximum of 24. So that that um, so that did not um, was not to his advantage. So that's why he built the mixed use building with a 300 square foot um, retail or office space, um, and and that location would have been would have been fine for an apartment building. It would have uh, fit in with the, you know, the surrounding neighborhoods and, and uh, wouldn't, ha would have been, uh, would have been um, fine to be located there. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. So impact, uh, we could certainly uh, take a look at, um, you know, how could we analyze that, uh, forecasting that in the future. Um, I, I can't really comment of how that could be done right now, but we could certainly explore what where what are the um, what are the ways what are the measurable ways to indicate change, um, you know, two, ten years, fifteen years, et cetera. You know, one thing I thought sure. about was when you did uh, the oh sorry, you know, Jen. Let's uh, okay. Let's get some other uh, of the board members uh, to get their thoughts, and you can come back around that that's okay, right? All right, uh, so we have Tom and Maria. I said, um, thank you for the presentation. I just had a quick question about um, the phasing and, and wondering, I mean, I, I understand that you can't do everything at once. And I see things like creating a new classification and definition being a challenging project. 
but I'm wondering if the moment to change, you know, uh, to redefine apartments as multifamily dwellings is now while these changes are happening or whether, you know, adjusting the minimum number now is not a challenging um, prospect at this point. And I guess I'm wondering what the rationale is for those things to be in a phase two as opposed to since they seem like smaller bites um, to, to be part of this phase to, to sort of um, speed up that process. Yeah, no, that's a good question, Tom. Thank you. Um, so about the minimum, um, in order to uh, adjust the minimum, currently it's three and say if we wanted to adjust it to four units instead, uh, we would then need to create another use classification for a triplex. And then, so then you need to ask yourselves, well, what does that look like? Um, and, and so for duplexes, we have right. three categories for a duplex in the, in the bylaw, which is about owner-occupied duplex, a non-owner-occupied duplex, and an affordable duplex with a triplex looks similar. Yeah, and yeah. so then you're, you're starting yeah. to get into the weeds of, um, of, oh, yeah. well, of all, all those uh, having, that's a whole other conversation. Although I, I, I mean, I would, I personally, I would love, let's just do it all. Let's just do it all. I, I love that. Um, and the multifamily um, use, um, we, uh, we haven't had an opportunity to really reach out to our assessor uh, about this topic, and um, and we would be very curious of how uh, would if 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 at all would that impact the way that she classifies uses for tax purposes. And so we would just want to make sure that we have all the ducks in the row of how what would there be any sort of ripple effects of would other uses other residential uses in the bylaw need to be adjusted as well if we yeah. were to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Maria, please. Sorry, I, I miss all your spreadsheets, all those little pie graphs. <laughs> and no, no Excel spreadsheet this time or graph. Um, that's really, is really useful to uh, see the areas um, where this is possible. And I like the idea of starting to break off um, the, the lower, the smaller size multifamily aspect, because then that allows for more, like you said, triplexes and maybe one day, if we further split it even more, you know, quadplexes, because the idea of adding multifamily infill into our residential areas is probably less impactful and scary than like apartment complexes. So I, I think the more you can sort of, um, loosen the way we can bring more multifamily into our neighborhoods is great. And um, and just that, I know it does open a can of worms because suddenly, you know, like footnote B, you would have to bring that into there and make sure it doesn't trigger, you know, like <clears throat> it falls under the same sort of like, it ignores the basic lot minimum and lot area per family. And, um, but yeah, I think that uh, I would love to see it relax more as far as, you know, um, the village center makes a lot of sense to make it an easier uh, permit review process. And if there are other areas that can follow suit, I mean, because right now a lot of apartments have been built, um, I think it was an overlay area or something where, you know, it was a it was an RN basically, um, a lot toward um, or at nine. So it seems like there's a lot of opportunity. It's just right now there, the bylaw won't allow it. So you're right, people are using mixed use building um, to get an apartment building basically. So um, it would be great to unlock that more in, in other zones. Um, and, um, but your first steps make, make a lot of sense. These sort of small bites at it. Um, I think the only sort of thing I would think more about is that point that Doug brought up, you know, why, why give it less density if we're trying to encourage, you know, these to be built more in certain zones? Why do that two foot every, every floor? Um, most of the zones only allow three to four stories anyways, right? Where, where they're mm -hmm, currently mm -hmm. allowed. So it's not like they're, you know, five to six story buildings anyways. So, um, but yeah, I, I'd love to get this, um, 
loosened up so that we're not seeing all these sort of uh, mixed mixed use buildings pop up <laughs> and just have them be what they are where they should be. And um, this is a great step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Jack, we have Mr. Marshall and Ms. McGowan. And Jack, you are muted. Uh, I noticed when I was coughing that I would, uh, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay, so now you can hear me. Doug, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say that my earlier comment in the conversation with Nate about doing 50% plus one as opposed to 50% might be applicable to this type as well, since we may have an odd number of floors that you know yield uh, odd numbers of total units that can't divide easily by 50% if you've got two types. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Janet? Um, in my so I'm actually wondering about um, changing the unit, um, increasing the unit number of units, and how it interfaces with the additional lot area, like um, how it interfaces with the dimensional table in terms of additional lot area and family like square feet that requirement, and so it will will that requirement still limit the number of units in a building? Um, I know that one of the um, limiting factors about building um, more additional units in the RG were the parking requirements and maximum lot coverage. So, if you're reducing if you're reducing parking requirements, um, does that mean that more units can be built in the RG, good or bad? But just to know that it's happening, and also what's how how the dimensional table like the changing. Um, like what Maria just said, like, oh my God, I just looked at footnote B and I'm like, how does that figure in and be affected by changing the unit count and things like that? So kind of the um, inner workings of our bylaw. So if I get a better understanding of, you know, how they relate to each other. Um, I also just wonder if we should also talk a little bit about the greens, or I would like to understand the green space requirements, because I know you know, obviously the pandemic made us all realize like if you're trapped in a Manhattan apartment building, <laughs> there was nowhere to go. Um, at least in Amherst, you can walk out your door and go somewhere. But I wonder, um, you know, when I when you describe those different apartment complexes that are in South Amherst, they all have a lot of places for people to go. Some of them don't have particularly much recreation on site and things like that, but maybe we should ask for some more green space so that there's more places for the tenants to be if we're, you know, or maybe we should just design our apartment buildings and even our mixed use buildings realizing primarily they're for people. So, but I, I would love you to help walk us through those different, how it, how the, it interrelates with the, the dimensional table. Sure, I, I will say that as these proposals would not impact the additional lot area per family, okay. um, or it wouldn't, and it wouldn't impact any of the other dimensional regulations under table three. And if we were to say, let's do the triplex now, um, yeah. that would actually, then we would also need to discuss um, the, the different footnotes and, and, and um, possibly. So that, that's like another, another reason to postpone uh, with a triplex but so again with these proposals the dimensional regulations as is would not be impacted um one way or the other um the parking requirement would right if it was reduced would affect yes yeah, so uh, yeah correct but yeah i was just talking about table three for the dimensional regulations those wouldn't be impacted but um yeah so we have the proposal about the parking which would be um, parking shall adequate parking shall be provided, and uh, again, that would be at the discretion of the planning board and the zoning board of appeals um, for that. For, you know, for each application, um, and, and um, the proposal gives you a sort of um, would give the applicant and the board's guidance to help determine um, 
is that adequate or or you know or whatever the um the whatever the situation is um regarding if it's close to downtown or or et cetera um, great <clears throat> so let's um take this to public comment um right now i see one hand uh, and two Okay, so let's start with uh, Pam Rooney. Pam, uh, again, state your name and, and address. Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Um, good, good, good presentation, good information. I'm I, asking the same questions. What is the real difference between a mixed use building and, and the apartment buildings? It sounds like if the unit count can go up, in fact, you can build a bigger box call it an apartment and fill it with as many blocks of one and two and three bedroom units as you can, it will be in fact, it'll function very much like the mixed use building. The, it feels to me that the reason that we have this, you know, the, obviously this flood of mixed use buildings is because there is so much flexibility in both the, the unit count that they can stuff into a, a box and, um, uh, and therefore, it, it's just more advantage, advantageous. Um, having having a comparable uh, apartment bylaw feels to me that you know, with some of these other questions that need to be answered, but still, it feels like it will take perhaps some of the the pressure off mixed use only, and have an alternative um, development. Uh, opportunity. Uh, that said, it occurs to me that because there is mixed use and, and apartment buildings are really so similar or could be very similar, that perhaps there ought to be greater emphasis on the commercial aspect of the mixed use building since that is what we really do want them to be functioning as. We want them to add to the commercial base uh, and availability of business space in town and if we can take the pressure off the housing by making apartments a little more flexible, then we perhaps can accomplish that. I was curious if, uh, and I think I heard the answer, but if uh, there's still an open space requirement for apartments that is not actually required for the mixed use. So that might be a difference between the two types. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Maureen, do you want to respond to any of that? Um, sure. Um, so the apartment section uh, current in the BN does have a open space requirement of 40%. Um, that's a, a very a small area of town. Um, uh, uh, I should have counted how many parcels. It's probably my guesstimate is like 10 parcels. Um, but um, so that's the only zoning district that does have open space requirement. That being said, there are uh, lot coverage, maximum lot coverage requirements and building lot coverage requirements. And so uh, when, um, and, and so the remainder of the land uh, in, on, in parcels throughout the zoning districts do have a requirement for providing open space when you uh, you take the the total land area mi minus the lot area provides uh, a, a pretty significant amount of of open space in 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 a lot of the zoning districts. Um, there are certainly um, uh, exemption uh, exclusions from that, uh, especially in, in the downtown. But if I take a look here now. Um, you know, the BG zoning district, the law cover, the maximum law coverage is 90%, um, which that, that means only 5% would be for, uh, for pervious surfaces. Um, but uh, other than that, throughout all the other zoning districts, it, it really, um, you know, provides a ample amount of, of, um, of pervious surface um, th throughout a lot of the residential districts. Um, so um, 
while, while again, there isn't a, a open space or a plaza section, there, the, the law coverage requirement under the table three does, does capture those topics currently. Um, and that's, that's all I had to say. Very good. So uh, we're on to Dorothy Pam. Dorothy. Uh... Hi, Dorothy. Hi, <clears throat> Dorothy Pam 229 Amity. <clears throat> so you're talking about something I'm very interested in um, because um, I got to block that out. <clears throat> Are you, I, I, can you hear me? Something just popped up on my screen. No, we, we can, can hear you. you. Okay, it's Adobe no. Flash wants to come in. Okay, I'm very interested in apartments because I do realize that there will be more apartments coming into the RG, um, particularly, you know, because they, if there are corners or near commercial areas or whatever. And so I went and took a look and drove through Aspen Heights because from the road, it was actually looking uh, attractive. And I thought, oh, wouldn't this be exciting? A nice looking apartment building. Um, and I, I do think it looks nice, but it had absolutely no space of any kind. Um, even around the back, it was the teeniest, most narrow sidewalk, I think maybe like two feet. And um, there, were no, there was no green, no gathering space, a lot of parking, which you know I've said I want. And I thought, oh, this is just not a place that you could have children. Um, and I've been struck that you've been calling them now, not apartments, but multifamily dwellings. And I just wanna say, remember that there will be families and families do require some green space. Now, I live next door to um, a converted multifamily. It's a big monstrous historic house. I don't know how many students live in it, but there are 16 cars parked most of the time on, on Lincoln. Uh, what I see is a big, beautiful green lawn and I get along fine with them um, because of their space. They have some space where they can hang out, they can walk around. And then when they're sitting and talking quietly, because these are very well-behaved students next door to me, um, it's not like they're coming in my ear or in my bedroom window because there's space between my house and where they're hanging out. Um, so it's, it's still a living space for people. There's no children there, but it's, it's still, uh, it's pleasant. And when I looked at, um, well, you know, 132 Northampton Road, it has beautiful outdoor grounds. Um, I, I just think apartments, multifamily dwellings, you have to make sure that there is the green space around it for people, whether they're students or whether they're families, whether there's children or not. And I didn't totally follow um, Maureen's um, numbers, but she said there would be. So I'm hoping that's true. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Yeah, and, and, and that is a point well taken, uh, Dorothy, um, especially for, um, you know, a, apartment buildings, sort of communities and, you know, creating communities and um, thinking about families and and whether play equipment or community gardens are are provided, things of the, those sorts of nature and uh, nature is provided. And, and you know, we could certainly look at um, looking at providing sort of um, uh, recreational amenities, um, making that a requirement, or or um, or plazas. I do feel that under section 10.38 and section 11.24, um, there are um, uh, sections uh, within that that get into providing recreational amenities uh, and open space. And I, I also would add that Aspen Heights is proposed, has constructed a, a, a play area um, and um, I, I know it is there. Um, yeah, I I can't really sp I can't really speak to the open space. I, I wasn't there a part of the approval process for that, but I do know that they are proposing uh, a play area stru structure. Um. Good, thank you, uh, Chris. I was going to say exactly that. Um, what Maureen said that Aspen Heights is going to have a play area for um, children and families to gather outside, and I believe they're also going to have a dog walking yep. area and other places for the people who live there to um, gather outside. So. Thank you. So um, I think we've, we've covered that and we can go on to item C, uh, proposed changes to demolition delay for structures of historical um, 
or architect architectural uh, significance, section 13 of the zoning bylaw. And I assume that'd be Ben? Ben, yep. Okay. Hello. Hi, Ben. Hello. Introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, everyone. It's good <laughs> to see you all again. Uh, ben Breger, I'm a planner in the planning department, colleagues with Maureen and Nate and Chris. Um, so I just, I guess I just wanted to check in. It's, you know, not nine o'clock. Um, I have a presentation. This is a, you know, brand, will be a brand new topic for the planning board. Um, do I kind of give a quick overview or, you know, or what, what, what we did with the CRC yesterday was just uh, offered uh, members the chance to ask questions um, rather than giving the presentation, but um, I, I, I guess I'm just wondering where to go. From how, how long is your presentation, would you guess? Um, yeah, I mean, it depends if I, I can, if I go through like all of the changes in detail, um, it could take, you know, 15 minutes, but if I kind of just give an overview of what the demolition delay bylaw is and then talk about the changes broadly, it could be quicker. Um, Quicker sounds better. Yeah, yeah, you know? I, yeah, exactly. May I just say something? Yeah. Um, the idea with this is that it's going to be taken out of the zoning bylaw and put into the general bylaw. So in the end, the town council is probably going to be more involved in the details of it than the planning board, but it's, um, it's worth hearing about it anyway. Yeah, that's a good point, Chris. Um, Have we ever really been involved with I don't recall. No, but well, it's part of the zoning bylaw. It's, um, oh, just it's part of the bylaw. Yeah, but it never really comes before us. Really been involved with it. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Ben. So yeah, here I'll um get this open now. Um, so are you seeing the full slide or like the uh, the viewers? We're it's seeing like we got... your, the notes. Okay. Yeah, we... I never know how to um if you uh yeah, swap it, uh, presenter. PDF. Is that there you go? Okay. Yeah, so um uh, let me just start here, kind of a little bit of an overview of what the demolition delay bylaw is. Um there it's not unique to Amherst. Um there's 160 municipalities in Massachusetts that have a demolition delay bylaw. Um, the idea is that it's a, a, a an authority granted to the historical commission um, to place a delay on the demolition of a significant historically significant uh, building, and so the demolition delay bylaw is used as a means to save a building um, from imminent uh, threat uh, from an imminent threat um, from being lost, and so essentially it's to it's to work with a property owner who's proposing to demolish their building to ask them to you know step on the brakes take a pause let's think about alternative ways to save this building relocate the building reuse the building rather than just uh moving hastily to demolish the building um and there's a lot of different there's the makeup of a demolition delay bylaw is pretty standard, but there's um, a lot of different components of it that can differ slightly in different communities. So, you know, there's things that are as simple as how do you define a building and how do you define demolition, which you would think would be straightforward, but it can actually get fairly nuanced. Um, and as we'll see in, Am in Amherst, that those have been two of kind of nagging issues is how is the definition of a building and how is the definition of demolition interpreted and applied. And so that's one thing we're proposing to do is to clarify that language. Um, there's also kind of this threshold for what what buildings actually get reviewed. And so in Amherst, it's 50, 50 year, years old. If a, if a permit for demolition is submitted, um, it's flagged if it's older than 50 years and then um, sent to the historical commission. And that differs from community to community. Um, there's criteria for how the historical commission determines if a building is historically significant. 
There's a, another kind of set of criteria to determine if a building gets, uh, we're it, the term is preferably preserved, that is analogous or the, the, uh, the same as synonymous with uh, a delay being placed, preferably, preferably preserved is um, delaying the demolition. Uh, there's the length of the de demolition delay. In Amherst, it's 12 months. It's as high as 24 months in some towns. Uh, others have 18 months, um, but 12 is kind of smack dab in the middle. There's the role that the commission plays during the demolition delay period, often to take an active role to, um, to work with the uh, property owner, to, um, to find an alternative, to relocate the building possibly, to, to restore the building to, for some sort of adaptive reuse. Or you know, if, if truly there, there's no viable option, the uh, applicant can come back to the commission and have the delay lifted um, to, uh, to take down the building. And then there's the role of staff during this whole process, um, which we'll talk about. So um, a little bit of the history, Article 13 was adapted, adopted by town meeting in May of 1999, uh, subsequently amended in 2005. And uh, the main change that happened there was to extend the delay um, from six to 12 months. Uh, these are just two examples of buildings that have been uh, saved uh, due to the demolition delay uh, bylaw. The Bertucci's building was saved. Uh, a delay was placed on that building. Um, and I think that was before it became Porta. It became Porta, which didn't work out so well. And then now a new restaurant is moving in to that uh, space. So, you know, that that was probably going to be demolished for a, for a taller mixed use building, perhaps. Um, and it was retained and is, you know, still a functional restaurant um, and kind of has, it, it's a 1946 automobile shop, which is kind of unique um, and has been kind of, it's a good example of adaptive reuse. Uh, Similarly, just uh, earlier this year, um, a delay was placed on the demolition of this 1862 home on South Pleasant Street uh, that Amherst College owns. Um, and currently there's a proposal to relocate that building um, by, uh, to, uh, to uh, University Drive South in that region. Um, and I, you know, I can't say for certain, but Amherst College could have taken that down, taken that building down with that. Uh, um, without a demolition delay placed on it. Um, there's other examples, uh, but um, this, I just kind of, these were the first two that came to mind. Um, so kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, the overview of the bylaw in Amherst. Um, again, the definition of demolition, it's, you know, paraphrased here a little bit, but, you know, the crux of it is destroying, removing, or raising a structure or portion thereof. So it's that or portion thereof that gets, uh, is a little bit, is certainly vague and um, can mean different things. And it's often unclear, kind of like, if someone's taking out the windows, is that demolition? If they're redoing their siding, is that demolition? Because it says portion thereof. Um, so it's, uh, it puts the building commissioner in a position to kind of have to interpret um, something that's pretty important and could be clarified. So the definition of a structure um, is similarly a little bit vague. Um, any edifice, object, or building of any kind that is construed or erected and requires more or less permanent location on the ground um, or attachment to an object with permanent location on the ground. So, you know, that could, that has been determined it could mean fences it could mean stone walls you know statues garden you know where pergolas things like that so clarifying that um the age threshold it's 50 years that's what's kind of flagged by the building commissioner to um send it down to the historical commission um if you go into the bylaw itself we have 11 criteria that are used to determine his uh, significance and they get very quite detailed um, and are uh, 
you, you only need to kind of hit one of those to to be for a building to be determined significant. Um, similarly, there's very little uh, criteria for how once a building is determined to be significant, when is it actually for, uh, determined to be a delay should be placed on it. There's little um, guidance for the commission to work off of other than that, it, you know, the proposed demolition would be detrimental to the historical or architectural resources of the town. Um, and surprisingly, actually, in our um, re reaching out to, you know, Ma Massachusetts Historic uh, Com Commission and representatives there, very few towns actually have, you know, criteria for determining whether a delay should be placed. They, they kind of all have this vague language about detrimental to the architectural heritage or historical her heritage of the town. So we're proposing to add a little bit more guidance there. Um, whoops. Again, like the length of delay is 12 month. We're not proposing to change that. Um, right now, the role of staff is really just to facilitate the review process. Um, and also uh, we end up carrying out research on these properties and uh, giving the commission um, uh, more information about the historical, um, you know, who lived there, when was it built, how has it changed over the years. And then currently there's no um, appeal process. Um, I, I, wrote, I wrote in here possibly ZBA question mark, because um, I think because it's in the zoning bylaw, that's the default route. Um, and I'm not sure if that's occurred before, but um, what, you know, what we've discussed uh, as staff is um, because this is now moving to the general bylaw, um, we're, we're proposing to treat this kind of like the local historic district commission where an appeal is brought, a third party um, is brought in such as like PVPC to kind of help arbitrate some of the disagreement. Um, and and um, and also, there's um, the the actual action that the historical commission takes is uh, you know essentially a, rec a, a a recommendation to the building commissioner to to not issue the demolition permit for a year, and so like that is. Um, what, what we're proposing is a new kind of um, certificate, which I'll talk about, which is like a, an official, more official um, action than a, a recommendation. So um, here's the little flow chart I made to kind of show kind of the current system where the demo permit application is submitted. We review it internally as staff. We determine if it meets the definition of demolition and if it's 50 years or older or not. If it's not the issue, issue the demo permit is issued, um, assuming it meets all the other, you know, it's a complete application and it's uh, they have utilities sign off and all of that. Um, but if it does meet this criteria, then it is sent to the commission, and the commission then hold has to hold a public hearing. And at this public hearing, they uh, have kind of two tasks, and it's they first determine is the building significant by running through 11 different criteria, which certainly, which takes a while. And then second, if it is determined to be significant, is there a delay placed on the building? Um, and so a building can either be not significant and it's, you know, uh, the demo permits issued, it can be significant, but no detrimental impact of the demolition. There's been a few examples of that. Um, it, the demo permits then issued, but they can, it can also be significant and uh, the impact of demolition is detrimental to the town. And then that's when a delay is placed. And so just briefly, some of the issues with the demo delay by law in Amherst that we're looking to change. Is there's a really high caseload for the historical commission. Uh, next Wednesday, we have four uh, demolition applications that we're reviewing. And, you know, I think only two of them are, um, you know, pre 1900s, you know, farm farmhouses that uh, frankly should be in front of the historical commission while the other two will probably 
um, be reviewed fairly quickly. Um, and so cutting back and what, you know, the historical commission takes on a lot, a lot of work, different projects, CPA funded projects. So giving, freeing them up to do more uh, preservation work and planning work um, would be great. Um, currently there's no role for staff to play in um, reviewing projects for significance. Um, yeah, and like the definitions of demolition and structure are vague. Um, there's also this issue that uh, maybe is a little bit nuanced down here that it's our, our timeline, our, I call it like our timeline basically where because the application for the historical commission and the building department are the same, like we, when someone applies for historical commission review, they're arbitrarily starting the timeline for the building department, which they have to approve that permit within, I think, 30 or 60 days. And so that um, we also have our own timeline. So I don't need to get into too many details there, but um, just wanting to separate out the historical commission review from the building department um, is something we want to do as well. And then adding an appeals process. So, um, I just want to also mention this bylaw has been in development for many, many, many years. It's not something that's been worked on in the past. You know, certainly there's been a, a big push in the last year, but I think, you know, Nate and Chris and Rob can attest to the fact that there's been many, many versions of this circulating for maybe, a, you know, at least five years. Um, and the Historical Commission has taken a, a very active role in drafting the new uh, bylaw that we're proposing. Um, and so I think I'll, you know, skim through the proposal um, and maybe I'll just bring you to the flow chart um, that, you know, it's a bit more graphic and easy to understand, but um, what we're proposing for the new, uh, you know, kind of process for how this would work is that the demo permit is submitted and then staff uh, working with, we're gonna say like a historical commission designee. So that could be one, maybe the chair of the commission. They work together to quickly review whether a building is found to be significant. And if it's not, um, then the issue, then the um, demolition permit is issued. And uh, if it is, and it also meets the definition of demolition and it's 50 years or older, then it's sent to the commission. And so that kind of takes out, that filters out um, a lot of projects that, um, you know, meet the definition of demolition or a building that's 50 years or older, but just don't have any historical significance um, or architectural significance. Um, and uh, we've changed the criteria to make to make it a little bit uh, more concise, kind of what this significance criteria is, but we're proposing this two-step process to filter out cases and only send cases to the historical commission for truly uh, buildings that are, you know, have historical significance. And then the commission is really looking at, should the building be, uh, should there be a delay placed on the building? Um, and I guess um, maybe I'll just stop there. We did a lot to, um, with the wording to kind of refine the definition of building and demolition, but maybe we can save that more detailed conversation for another time. But that's kind of the broad overview of how we got to where we are now and some of the bigger, higher level changes that we're proposing, um, so. Here's some nice pictures. Great, ben. Thank you. <laughs> um, and do we have any uh, questions for Ben from the from the board? Uh, Andrew, and then Jenna. I have a real quick one on the mm -hmm. last flow chart or the second flow chart. Um, oh, it's, uh, I'm trying to pull it up on my. Yeah, there's. I can do. Yeah. Okay. The I was I was just curious, like the the third sub bullet under the 
public hearing, consider owner's plans for reuse, reconstruction or restoration. Like what if they have no plans? What if they just want to demolish it? Is that, that considered a negative or a positive? I, I guess I, I, I sometimes struggle with sort of the, the intent of, of this. If, you know, we're, the purpose is to keep, it's like a stay of execution for a year, right? And if like someone wants to demolish it, um, they can't afford its upkeep um, and we're just sort of maybe complicating things for it. And as soon as the year is over, they're going to demolish it anyway. Um, I, I don't know what necessarily value it has, but I, I was curious to know specifically, like, is there, is, is, is it considered a negative thing? Would it impact the demolition or preservation distinction if the owner didn't want to do anything other than just demolish it? Thank you. Um, yeah. Ben? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say if it would, how, it, how in that example, how it would impact um, their decision. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's the plans for reuse and reconstruction and rest, or restoration, that's just a one consideration during the, um, their deliberation on placing, um, deciding to place a delay and um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, I think that their main focus is on kind of like, what is the value of the building as it stands now? But um, I think for them to make a fully informed decision, um, understanding kind of what, if they, if they do place a delay, if they don't, if they don't, place a delay what is going to be in that space um is something they're gonna they want to be able to consider as a commission i see that nate uh can speak yeah to this oh sure thanks jack yeah so yeah that's a good question i think you know currently the way the bylaw is written the commission is not supposed to consider at all what the future use of the property or site is going to be so it's really about you know is the building significant and the you know, staff thought that was a little short-sighted with respect to that there could be a reuse potential, whether it's the same building or not, that may keep some of the same historical architecture or, you know, replicate some of the same character uh, in a new building. And so, you know, oftentimes the commission is kind of left asking, well, they would like to ask, what are the plans? Because maybe if the owner is thinking about a building that may actually, um, you know, not, you know, may actually, uh, you know, contribute to the architectural streetscape that, you know, demolition could be okay. And so um, it's, you know, as Ben said, it's only one new criteria, but it's kind of significant in the respect that right now the commission is really not supposed to ask that at all. Um, and it also, I think it's important because um, it's really, you know, the commission has a, a role during delay to help an owner, but with the new bylaw, we're really trying to I encourage the commission in the town and the applicant to look at, um, you know, take, you know, steps to try to reuse structures. So, you know, at the time of the hearing, they may not have an idea for the property and that, you know, and maybe the commission will say, we would like to explore what could happen with this. You know, if you don't have any plans, then what's the rush? Let's explore some alternatives. And so I think having this type of provision just allows the commission um, to ask a few more questions of the applicant that they really can't ask right now. Thank you, Nate. Uh, Janet, and then Tom. So I, I found this presentation and the um, draft really hard to understand because it was hard to compare it to the original language. Uh, so it's like a, you know, it's, it's a revision, but I, I was hard, I always find myself flipping back and forth between the zoning bylaw and, um, and then looking at the presentation, it didn't, it wasn't that clear to me what the changes were. And there seemed to be significant changes when I looked at the details, but they weren't really highlighted in the PowerPoint. So I think it'd be important to compare the two, the two, the two, the old, the current bylaw, zoning bylaw, to what you want. And so, so anyone who's reading it, especially as a lay reader with probably less patience or um, than me could understand where the changes were because um, there's changes for timing and, and different things. So it wasn't clear to me from this presentation what the changes were being made. Um, there was changes in timing, um, notice, 
who the decision makers are. Um, I actually liked the original significant structure definition. Um, it was um, it was kind of, it was very detailed and it was much more clear. And so in a weird way, and the the new definition was kind of less clear and kind of shorter. And I just thought the old one really would lay out for anybody exactly what would be historically significant. And so I thought stick with that one. It was so much more easy to read. And um, it, seemed to, it seemed to encompass more um, and put the buildings in a physical context or a geographic context. Um, it wasn't clear to me where in the new revision, where the historical commission could add conditions to the demolition approval. Like it was referred to in this presentation, but I couldn't find it in the draft. So maybe it's somewhere. Um, I don't really understand why the building commissioner is involved in making the determination of historical significance. Um, I know there's somebody, someone from the historical commission will also be doing that, but it struck to me if there's a lot of buildings coming in, you want people with a background in history and architecture to make that determination. And maybe if there's a lot coming in, it could be a subcommittee of the historical commission. I know from his, many historians that I know, everybody has a specialty in a different area. And so it's, it's you know, having extra people in would be helpful. And I just didn't understand like the background of the building commissioner, you know, nothing to say against Mr. Moore, but building commissioners of the future, like making that determination. Um, another question is in, about definitions. In the notice um, of the proceeding, the hearing, it talked about parties and interests, but I didn't know who they were. Um, it seemed like a lot of people could be really interested in the building Oh, I didn't, I just had no idea who they were. In the appeal provision, I didn't know who a person agreed would be um, in much the same way. It seemed very, it could be very broad. At one point, the, um, the draft referred to town, town staff. And I just thought, you know, hopefully I just had no idea who that could be. It could be somebody, you know, sitting at a desk or somewhere. So I thought that could be more specific. Um, you know, I, I actually, and I, the improvements I saw in it, I think, were to the timing and how the process went, it was more clear, but there were also timing changes that were hard to track and figure out where a difference. And I began to wonder why, when you did this, you just didn't work off what we have and kind of fix up what was there and things like that. So it's hard to compare two things that aren't set up side by side, but I could see how towards the end of our current bylaw, zoning bylaw, there were improvements in clarity in the appeals process or the um, hearing process, there were some changes in timing. I didn't know if it was too fast or too slow because they weren't really next to each other. So I think in the presentation of this, it maybe that clarity for that. And then, you know, I, there were also like sort of Scrivener's or kind of little confusions in it. I don't want to go into that, all that detail, but I did kind of go through it really detailed for one hard look. And I'm sure if I'd looked at it again, I'd find some more. So that's a lot. So. Uh, Nate, you have your hand up. Yeah, sorry. Let me lower my hand. That was um, just oh, okay. over. But I, I will to to Janet. To one thing for Janet, I just want to say that the previous bylaw had so many inconsistencies. You know, it was within zoning. It mentioned Chapter Forty A, but then the notice requirements uh, didn't actually match Forty A, and it said you had to hold the hearing in one place, but in another section it didn't. And so, you know, staff and the commission really felt that the model of the, of the current article 13 wasn't worth trying to change because it was, it was so much was changing. And so it was actually cleaner to start with a whole nother draft. And I know that makes it difficult to do like a side-by-side -side comparison, but sometimes it's, it's just more difficult to try to, you know, track change a document to the point where you're just deleting everything and starting over. So the decision was made to actually just start a fresh, um, you know, Article 13. So um, I think, you know, we could probably do, you know, have um, some way to make a, you know, comparison more, um, you know, more legible, whether that's, you know, some call outs in the text or something, but it was really just, you know, a, a ease of, of working a new draft rather than just, you know, track changing something so much. Great. I Thanks, Nate. Tom? Oh, Ben, uh, do you want to speak? To yeah, just yeah, just building off what Nate said. Uh, there's also the fact that we I put this in the format of the general bylaw. Um, so it, 
which isn't really consistent with the zoning bylaw formatting. So that made it also difficult to do like a <clears throat> direct track changes version of, of, of this. Um, I will just say quickly to, to one other Janet, to, uh, another of Janet's points is um, the building commissioner is not the one uh, determining significance. That would be uh, planning staff, work, the staff liaison to the historical commission um, whether it's myself or Nate working with uh, the chair or a small group of the commission members. So. Thank you. Tom, please. Sure, thanks, Jack. Um, thanks for the presentation, Ben. I think um, I put my hand up and then I took it down and then I put it back up and I took it down again. I, I have, um, I feel like I keep harping on this, but I feel like um, some of the language here is just incredibly Eurocentric and I'm interested in how we imagine preservation um, in regard to indigenous populations and, and other landscapes and structures that might not be considered buildings that are in need of protection and where that falls into these categories in both public and private land and um, how that's considered in relationship to this. Um, so I, again, I don't know where it fits in here and how one brings it to the table, but it seems like um, it's part of demolition and it might be something we want to consider. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll go. I mean, just quickly, Tom, I will say that Mass okay. Historic, you know, they, you know, this has been a kind of a, a, a tried and true method for preserving structures and buildings as a demolition bylaw. They recommend if you want to preserve landscapes or other things that there's other um, tools, you know, legal tools or regulations. And so Mass Historic really tries to make a distinction between preserving landscapes, which really isn't part of a demolition bylaw and preserving structures. And so um, I do hear what you're saying. So there, you know, um, you know, sometimes people come and say someone wants to cut down a really important tree or they, you know, they are changing something, um, you know, a historic piece of town that isn't a building. And so there are a few different uh, uh, tools to do that. Um, but, you know, it's typically that a demolition bylaw doesn't address, you know, those features. Uh, right. I mean, it's for me, it's like you could put a building on a thing, which is actually destroying that thing. Right. right? right. So I, I guess, so I, I don't, it seems like it's in the building purview because you're putting something somewhere that might be destructive. Right. I, I, again, I don't know where the nuance is and who's in charge of that, but I, I just wanted to raise it and make us aware that that is definitely an issue. And especially when it comes to some of our, our parks and landscapes and trails and structures that are being put up and things like that um, should also be considered in relationship to that. Right. Right. Uh, Janet, please. So that actually, I think one. I think the um, some of some of Tom's concerns could be addressed by the um, the criteria for um, significant for significance, and so a significant structure because it does talk about geographic importance or importance a group of people and the importance you know that they you know they had some influence on society. So there's this this definition. The original definition is very detailed and broader. And the new definition is more kind of fuzzy, but actually seems more narrow. So I would I would stick with the the original. I think that's it's got good stuff in it. We could encompass sort of less traditional, you know, it's a beautiful church or a house of a wealthy person kind of thing. It could it could it's a broader definition and more detailed. So I would and maybe even those issues could be added to that. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Maria, please. I remember uh, years ago when this came to us, one of the big hot buttons was uh, the 50 year thing because, uh, you know, right now, 50 years ago was, you know, our lovely 1970s era of the contempo houses. And so those are considered historic now. So I was just wondering if there was any headway on that definition of the um, uh, time set for what is considered historic. Was that still being looked at or? Is 50 something you guys have just settled on? Thank you. Um, ben or Nate? Yeah, I'll make up an answer. The um, No, the, the commission in uh, last July, we had Chris Skelly from the Massachusetts Historical Commission 
give a presentation uh, about you know what you know what are some elements of a demolition bylaw and you know there's there's a few different ways to capture what what could be um, reviewed under this and one is you know setting a, you know a date like 50 years old or 75 years old or something you know 50 years is the National Park Service standard and so that's something we kept you know some communities will have a date certain you know as of 1935 anything that's built prior to it and then maybe with some language for exceptions if it's a unique or you know unique structure or site or something um, and then others will say if they've done a really thorough inventory you know any house that's been inventoried only those properties that have been inventoried are subject to a, a demolition review I think you know what the commission thought at the time was that we still have so many properties in buildings outbuildings especially you know accessory buildings that haven't been inventoried that really wasn't a, a proper threshold. And then, um, you know, in terms of um, using a, a certain calendar year date, you know, they thought that that could miss something. So at some point, you know, maybe, right, those contemporary homes or the post-World War II Cape, maybe there are just a few left if everyone's demolishing those. And so at what point, you know, what's considered historically significant, you know, even sometimes, you um, you know, it's not just high architecture, right? It can be something that, you know, sir, you know, is emblematic of a certain time period. So the commission felt 50 years for now, but it was a discussion that they had um, in terms of what are, what is the threshold for reviewing a property or structure? Good, good. Thank you. Um, I see no other comments from the board and open up to the public. We see any hands. And I see none. So let's uh, close that up. And uh, I guess we would go to Chris for an update on the other zoning priorities and work plan. Um, we're continuing to work on um, the zoning priorities. And on uh, Monday, we're going to be presenting accessory dwelling units and um, well, the planning department will be presenting accessory dwelling units to town council for um, referral to back to the planning department and the CRC for a public hearing. And um, a group of citizens is going to be proposing um, some changes to the converted dwelling section of the bylaw to the town council for the same reason. So those are two things that are going before the town council on Monday. And then on, um, I think on May 24th, depending on how far we get with it, we may present um, the mixed use building to town council on May 24th. Um, but again, it depends on how far we get with it. And, and I think that the next opportunity to talk to the CRC about it isn't until May 25th. So we may need to postpone that. Um, and it sounded like you all had a lot of questions and comments about it. So we'll have to think about um, you know, what we do with that. As far as other things go, um, you know, we're continuing to pursue the list of things that we were given to work on. So um, more to be said about that in the future. Good, good. Okay. Um, and then, um, and then we're meeting next Wednesday for that joint hearing with the CRC on the moratorium and, and the inclusionary zoning. That's correct. Yeah. Um, any other old business you want to bring up at this point? I don't have any other things to bring up? No. Okay. Or a new business? No. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. So, thank you all. Um, excellent presentations uh, by Nate, Maureen, and and Ben. Thank you. And everyone, have a good evening. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good night. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you.